Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the MinMax Show, a good place to forget bad things. I'm Ben Hansen, but thankfully I'm not alone. We're joined by Kyle Hilliard. Hello! Jeff Marchiafava. Hey! And more specifically, Jeff Marchiafava's house, if you're watching the video version, no, is something that no one has ever seen. You can actually get a glimpse of his life if you look at the fridge in the background. There's a lot of revealing yeah. photos. Yeah. And then we have so Suriel Vasquez. Hello. Welcome, and we're joined by a very special guest. Uh, I will just go ahead and call you the world's biggest Resident Evil fan, CVX freak, Alex Aniel. Hey guys, how's it going? Really, really Hi, Alex. good. Uh, we have you because we're going to talk about Resident Evil 3. The remake is out this week. Uh, we've all played it. Most of us have beaten it. Alex has uh, beaten it a couple times. We'll get into it. Um, mm. So we'll talk all about that remake, share our full thoughts on that. Then we're going to unpack the rumors about Mario's 35th anniversary. It's rumored that it's his 35th anniversary this year. Uh, hmm. So there's a lot of stuff about, oh my god, are there going to be remakes, releases, remasters? There's a lot to unpack in the world of 3D Mario, so we'll get into all that stuff. Then we have a bunch of very fun questions and comments from the community that we'll read off in the back half of the show. Uh, before we get to anything, though, I want to plug a couple things. Uh, first of all, Photo Mode Snap, Kyle, our new show where we review uh, screenshots from the community is going to be airing this Friday on our YouTube channel, so youtube.com slash show. so please check that out. Also, uh, something that's in the Patreon-exclusive audio feed, if you're a $5 supporter, you get access to it, um, is a, a video game spelling bee that we recorded at the very start of March at VGMCon, and it was incredibly fun, like... Just pulling all these strangers in a crowd together, which is very weird to hear a crowd now, but it was a different era at the start of March, apparently. Um, but just pulling all these strangers together to compete in video game spelling bee, where it's part spelling skills, but part also video game knowledge. Like, one of the words was like, all right, can you spell clob, the gun from Goldeneye? Like, that level of specificity. So it, there's a lot of fun stuff in there. I think it's it's one of my favorite things we've ever done, and so I hope people check that out and help spread the word about MinMax overall if they enjoy it. Let's see. Um, Serial, anything you want to plug? Uh, not right now, no. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, man. I love it. Uh, okay, uh, Alex, Resident Evil 3's remake. Um, I had a quick Twitter poll on the MinMax Twitter account ahead of time to see, like, hey, for everybody that's going to be playing the Resident Evil 3 remake, have you played Resident Evil 3 before? And a majority of people had not. And so I know it's going to be hard for you because you've just dissected the series and Resident Evil 3 specifically a million times. Um, but let's not try and spoil big things. Like specifically, I think of like locations in the back half of Resident Evil 3. Let's just leave that all out of it if we can. Jeff, I'm thinking hard about what that means. Mm. Okay. Uh, so I finished the game last night. Uh, Jeff, where are you at? I finished it. Great. Serial? Uh, I finished it last night as well. Okay. Kyle, the wimpy kid? Yeah, I'm like three, four hours in, I guess. Really? No Sorry. way. Really? At the bug sequence, you're three, four hours? Is that is that less, you think? <laughs> I, I mean, think I'm it might be less. a little bit. Okay. All right. Anyways, Alex and Yell. Two hours. No, okay. No. Have you finished the Resident Evil 3 remake, Alex? Ten times. <laughs> There you go. Be precise. We have a winner. Look, yeah, and you're not I... some random guy that happened to have oh. played the remake ten times. You are uh, what I would call a Resident Evil expert. People might recognize your voice. You've been on 8-4 Plays podcast a lot. Um, but at the same time, you are writing a book about the entire Resident Evil series, correct? Indeed I am, yes. Fantastic. And what's the book called? And an Itchy, Tasty History of Resident Evil. Is it out yet, or what can people do if they want to read this thing? Yeah, the uh, the book was crowdfunded uh, late last year, actually. So it actually surpassed uh, the goal by, I think, about a quarter. So maybe it's like 126% funded. Oh, wow. It's on Unbound, Unbound.com, a UK-based publisher. And uh, even though it's been funded, the campaign is still going on for people who, who haven't had a chance to check it out yet. So... I actually got an edited draft from my publisher a few days ago, and I've been going through it and making all sorts of uh, adjustments to it. Nothing huge. Uh, this is a normal part of the uh, book writing process. Yeah, uh, it's my first time, but you know, we need we rewrite it, and then we have editors look at it, and then hopefully the final product will be out before too long. Okay, and, and I, I do have two excerpts up on Polygon as well. That's right, and there's an article up on Polygon now that's about the origins of Resident Evil 3 to begin with. Can you just give us a quick 
synopsis of where the original Resident Evil 3 came from? Like, what is the development history of that game? Yeah, so Resident Evil 2 came out in January 1998, and it was a very successful game for Capcom. And they needed to make a sequel, but the director of that game, uh, Hideki Kamiya, who, who's now at Platinum Games, uh, he wanted to make the sequel, Resident Evil 3, for PlayStation 2, so it was going to take a while. And what Capcom decided to do in the interim was to make a spin-off uh, of the Resident Evil series on the PlayStation after uh, RE2 came out. So they decided to make a game... It was initially called Resident Evil 1.9, so it would take place before RE2, and it would have like a story that wasn't really uh, relevant. Would say it wasn't really not relevant, but it wasn't really connected to the main story. It wouldn't have like the same characters or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, as development progressed, uh, Resident what was supposed to be Resident Evil 3 was taking a lot longer than Capcom would have liked. So. For, for various reasons, financial and a little bit creative, they ended up adding a 3 to the game. They turned Resident Evil 1.9 into Resident Evil 3. Uh, the original Resident Evil 3 became Resident Evil 4, which became Devil May Cry. So Hang on, whoa, 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 okay, stop, 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 stop. Let, I don't, we, it's not a full tangent, but can you explain that, <laughs> that thread a little bit? Um, so, so... Kamiya, Kamiya's team was making Resident Evil 3, and it was going to be a gothic game that took place in a castle, and the protagonist of that original game was going to have superhuman abilities, so at some point, Capcom's management saw it and thought it would have been better to turn it into its own thing rather than making it into a Resident Evil game. So that's how that game became uh, Devil May Cry. So Devil May Cry, as you all know, originated as Resident Evil 4, uh, that is well, so Resident Evil 3 and Resident Evil 4. <laughs> but it, it's really confusing because that what, what Devil May Cry started out as was Resident Evil 3, but it became Resident Evil 4 when Resident Evil 1.9 became the Resident Evil 3. That <laughs> oh, my so God. It, it's, and this is why your book is 700 confusing. pages. <laughs> okay, so... 700 pages? Yeah. yeah. So, so, then, so if it didn't start main characters then, the original version of Resident Evil 3, when did they decide to be like, okay, let's throw Jill in here? Um, my understanding was Jill was supposed to be in a different game, uh, but for, for various reasons, uh, they ended up uh, adding her into Resident Evil 3 because I think I think Jill was supposed to be in Code Veronica, but there was something in Resident Evil 2's ending that prevented that from happening. So they put Jill into Nemesis, into RE3, and after that, after they decided to give that game a number... The, the Resident Evil 3 number, they decided to make the story uh, more substantial than it was supposed to be originally. Mm. I think um, originally the protagonist for Resident Evil 3 was actually supposed to be Carlos and two of his companions. So Nikolai and Mihail. So you can imagine it wasn't really related to the main storyline that was uh, in play at that point. Ooh, so right. yeah, that, game, that, game, that game went from being, you know very minor to being quite significant so it's it's a really interesting uh development story yeah and now it's beloved people demanding a remake and capcom went ahead and said yeah we'll give it to you faster than anybody could possibly imagine <laughs> one year after resident evil 2 2's remake but jeff Arkefava, i'm curious yeah. about you in particular um since you just played resident evil 2 like at the end of last year what what's your takeaway from finishing resident evil 3 uh i enjoyed it a lot i would say yeah the streamlined nature of it and it being a i don't want to say linear but the you go to a bunch of different areas that are all kind of smaller and more compact and i think that kept the pace moving along faster than i was expecting i honestly when i started it i only started it like two or three days ago i didn't think i was gonna get it done for this episode but then yeah. it, it went much faster than i was expecting it really hauls. So I clocked in uh, at six and a half hours was the game clock, but then it said total playtime was 8.5, so maybe I just had it paused for a long time. That's what I'm looking at. Does anybody have a ballpark for how long it took them to finish for the first time? I was around three hours. 10, which was 10. Okay, three hours, Sorry. Alex? That's insane. And 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay. My, my personal record is 59 minutes. <laughs> 
It's very impressive. So, so here's the thing. When talking about Resident Evil 3, I think the reviews are a little bit all over the place. Like GameSpot gave it a 6. I think Ben Reeves at Game Informer gave it a 9. It's a really interesting spread, and I think even a lot of discussions about the game... I think are going to skew towards the negative because so many people are directly coming off Resident Evil 2's remake, which I think, especially now in retrospect, is a miracle that that thing was released at the quality level it is. And so when you're comparing Resident Evil 3 to Resident Evil 2's remake, it's a lot of like, well, this isn't quite as good and this isn't quite as good. But at the same time, I think it's stressed like out of the gate. I had a really good time with this game. I still think it is a very well done game. I think it's a very fun game. But there are just certain step backs for certain people from what they want from Resident Evil, I think, that are going to maybe rub some people the wrong way. But uh, tell me if this is insane. Um, Sorry, uh, let me know if this is insane. I think Resident Evil 3 is 70% as good as the Resident Evil 2 remake. What is your number for how pers- <laughs> how good the game uh, is compared to the two? I, I would say it's somewhere around there, maybe. I, okay. I like it a little bit more just because I'm, sl- I'm not someone who's super bound to the idea of all Resident Evil games being like survival horror ish. So okay. I think uh, I think a lot of people criticized it for hey, it's got more of an action bent. There are more action elements, so it loses a little bit of it of its survival horroriness. And I I guess I don't really mind that. I really enjoyed the dodge stuff, uh, especially like there are certain enemies that are a lot easier to deal with. Um, like there are those enemies with the like the the weak point in front of their like that is their head, and then they have these little claws, and they have a thing behind them that is super vulnerable. So if you do the dodge behind them, it's super easy to just kill them when you do that. Right. Um, so like I, I enjoyed stuff like that. Um, and honestly, one thing I didn't expect was to be to like the uh, emotional beats between Carlos and Jill as much as I did. Really? I think it's, it's better than most of the stuff in like RE2 in terms of like a story perspective, because I came into like Resident Evil 3 thinking like, Oh, Carl, like, because Carlos, Mikhail and Nicola kind of all have this very, like, I'm, I'm an, I'm an umbrella, like Marine basically with like these really thick arms. And I'm just kind of like a meathead, but like by the end of it, like, I'm not saying it's like incredible writing or like, you know, a Red Dead 2 esque like tale. <laughs> But it's like I, I came to become invested in Carlos more than I thought I would and his relationship to Jill, specifically the thing about like, you know, um, Jill, the fact that Jill would trust Carlos after uh, having been kind of screwed over by Umbrella in the first game. Right. Is like an interesting plot beat. And they also do a lot with Jill like that. Those first that intro where they're they're kind of ruminating on the trauma of her having survived Resident Evil 1. Yeah. I think is like a really strong beat early on. And then it's just like, they, they give you no downtime between like, oh yeah, if something really bad has happened to it. And oh, guess what? It's going to happen again. Like it, it is not too far uh, until Nemesis enters the scene and just starts like relent- relentlessly hunting her. For sure. And like, uh, I don't even think we should spoil. We have a video up on Mimex's YouTube channel if you want to see the opening, but I think it's cool to leave it a little bit mysterious, but like the opening is different than... I expected, and I think a lot of the people out there expected. Um, but I think on the story front, that was actually one of the biggest disappointments with the game. And like, as much as I love Resident Evil 2's remake, I don't think like, the storytelling was top notch. But you could really zoom in on Resident Evil 3's remake and like the dialogue, like early on with Carlos, he goes, a Nemesis knows what he wants and he won't stop till he gets it. Don't you like that in a man? It's just like a lot of that, and it's a lot of screaming at monsters, yeah. going like, "Hey." Yeah, but- Right. Jill kind of like brushes that off in a fun she way. She does. I, I like think like Jill's I like, personality. I like Jill's characterization a lot in three. I'm not as cool as you guys. I'm not as far. Maybe she turns into a, you know, a bad character at some point in the game. But early no. on, I was like, I like Jill more than I thought I would. She you know? is cooler than I expected. I feel like every other character is pretty low. And even by the time I finished the game, it was one of those like, I just feel like maybe it was just moving so fast, but I didn't really soak in any of these characters. Like the characters you're interacting with at the end of the game, I'm like, I don't even know who you are. Like, I really don't know much about this. Okay. There's white hair accent guy. There's yes. curly hair guy. Mm-hmm. And Jill. And you Nemesis. got it. He's a character. And then, of course, Raccoon City's a character. Hansen. That's a great point. Uh, hey, Alex, your expert opinion. What do you think about Resident Evil 3's remake? Like, as a whole or about the character? Let's say as a whole, man. Talking about? Oh, boy. Where do I begin? Um, I... Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have the the big Resident Evil fan perspective here, and I think to to preface my opinion, Resident Evil Three Remake 
is quite a departure from a lot of the content of the original game. So this is the third remake we've gotten for the series. The first game stuck to the, the, the source material quite closely in retrospect. There are a few changes, there are a few improvements, but largely it was very similar to the, to the original framework. Resident Evil 2, I would say, was halfway between, where a lot of it was uh, recognizable from the original, but they also changed things where they made sense. Now, with Resident Evil 3, I feel like very little of what was in the original game has been carried over. Like, we have completely different locations. Uh, a lot of a lot of what was in the original game has just been cut out entirely, and that goes for locations, uh, key items. Um, Puzzles, very specifically. Certain puzzles, and uh, I would say one of the bosses has also been taken out of the game uh, for reasons I do not know, unfortunately. And I think if I think about this game as a re a remake of Resident Evil Three, I actually think it's a pretty it kind of fails in that regard. Hmm. Uh, I feel like the original Resident Evil Three was known for its unpredictability from playthrough to playthrough. Uh, it was a uh, designed to be uh, played multiple times, and there are a lot of interesting things you can unlock if you beat the game. Uh, I think as many as eight times. Uh, puzzle solutions would be randomized. You can see different cutscenes. You can even uh, experience a different ending if you uh, made certain decisions inside of the game for the original. But the remake gets rid of that, and everything in place of that, you end up with a very monotone scenario where everything is the same on each playthrough. And I feel like that disincentivizes uh replayability and i think uh, it's really unfortunate that they they took what made resident evil 3 so unique even even you know now that we're at seven right the latest game is seven uh, even after seven eight nine entries everything like resident evil 3 remake has been homogenized hmm. uh, and not necessarily to its benefit i feel like it's it it feels like a, a retread of the resident evil 2 formula with a few uh with a few changes to the combat, but not much more than that. And I found that to be really disappointing, actually. Uh, but it is a fun game to play. I think it. I think they've got the mechanics down uh, as good as they're going to be able to for a horror-oriented game. Uh, yeah, having without, the knife back, I think, is great. Diving into. I'm sorry. I said having the knife back. I think is is really great. Just to have that moment of like, okay, just gonna slice every zombie on the ground. Just make sure they're really dead and not just playing dead like yeah. they love to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, it's really complicated because, uh, like, Resident Evil, Resident Evil Three Remake. I feel it's very mechanical and impersonal at times. And I, I after like five playthroughs, I realize you know there's only really like one set of uh, what's a good way to describe it, like ludicrous items that you would never have any use for in real life. Um, you know, like Resident Evil has crests and really bizarre puzzles and, you know, you put the crest into the hole and the door opens, you, you push the statue and, you know, you find a secret tunnel. None of that is in this game, actually. Uh, you know, you, all you're really finding are keys and batteries and yeah, it, it, it's really, it really, it's, it, I feel like the remake is devoid of a lot of that Resident Evil personality, and I found that to be really disappointing. And I think there are like fewer than five puzzles in the game. And so. even, I mean, looking back on it, it's like thinking about puzzles in general. It's like it's so weird because so much of Resident Evil 2's remake, I feel like, was me like actually reading notes, going into those menus, looking at the files, trying to piece stuff together. And I think about the way I was playing Resident Evil 3, where it's like I don't even know if I went in that menu once like really and it was like maybe i was 70 percent of the way through before i realized like oh yeah there, there are no puzzles here like i'm really flying through this thing and this is my own personal taste but like i'm not a fan of puzzles i understand this contrary to a lot of what resident evil is known for and also like i'm a notorious coward um and so the fact that i think this is significantly less scary than resident evil 2 it's like well in some ways it's not better than resident evil 2 but it's like it's more up my alley but i understand that that is not what a lot of resident evil fans want i would say it's probably more user-friendly if you're not really into survival horror as much yeah it doesn't 
it's not really a, a perplexing game to play like other Resident Evil games can be at times. Uh, nothing, nothing's too cryptic. Everything's straightforward. And I, I do recognize that that's a legitimate uh, preference that people might have. Uh, it's just that I feel like maybe it's not quite Resident Evil enough in that regard, especially yeah. since Resident Evil 2 really doubled down on the ridiculousness of, of the series with, with the various puzzles and whatnot. For sure. And the weird thing, too, is like when talking about like a lot of the reviews out there is like, well, it's more action oriented. It doesn't feel that Resident Evil. I think it's important to remember like where Resident Evil was not that long ago. Like Resident Evil 6, in my mind, at least, was not that long ago. And the fact that people are like, well, it's kind of more action. I don't know if it's really Resident Evil. It's like this is still night and day so much better than I feel like the world of six and maybe even parts of five, you know, don't think that it's that action intent. It's still a lot of slowly methodically unlocking your way through these environments, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I actually found the level design to be kind of like resident evil six, uh, oh, really? with, with a tad with, uh, at least in the first part of the game, the first half, maybe, um, especially when we're outdoors. Cause resident evil six had, uh, Leon's chapter at the beginning where you're kind of running through the city uh, and it's very linear, which is which is how I would describe Resident Evil Three actually. Uh, and one one thing I was actually quite disappointed with with was that the city is not very open. Um, you're really just going through a bunch of alleyways uh, and side streets, and you don't really, at least in my opinion, get the sense that you're, you know, exploring a, an entire town. Right? I feel like. That's something, for example, the original Silent Hill did on the PS1 over 20 years ago. And this is, you know, despite, you know, three generations later, it's still a lot more restrictive. So, yeah. Well, you talk about like the original being renowned for kind of, I don't know, the surprises, but I feel like we haven't talked about the the elephant with a rocket launcher in the room here with Nemesis. Like, Mm -hmm. because I played Resident Evil 3, I finished it, but I mean, that was over 20 years ago at this point. like So my memory of this thing is very hazy. How dynamic was Nemesis in the original? I'm trying to remember. I would say for a PlayStation 1 game, uh, as, as dynamic as you were probably going to get for that era, and uh, given you know, where game design was at that point, uh, the game itself was very experimental. But basically, Nemesis, from playthrough to playthrough, I, I mean, technically... He does have scripted appearances, but the game is able to ma- was able to mask that enough where to the average player it felt like it was at least partly randomized. Like he might show up in this room when you're running through on one playthrough, but if you don't but if you replay the game, he might not appear and he'll appear somewhere else. And then that's obviously tied to the selection uh, feature that that game had. Whereas the one thing about Resident Evil 3 remake that really stuck out was that Nemesis has lost his sense of unpredictability. So he appears in the same spots at the same time every single time you play. So once you've played through the game once, you will know where Nemesis is going to appear. And a lot of, uh, a lot of the encounters with him are now scripted sequences where you're either running away from him or you're trying to do something to fight him, but it's not really... A free a free form boss battle like uh, the original game was, yeah. and I thought that was actually very surprising because Mr. Rex in Resident Evil 2 Remake is the opposite. He is very unpredictable, and his movement patterns throughout the police station in that game. I mean, I'm sure if you, if you analyze it, you could probably predict it to some extent, but you weren't necessarily going to run into him at the same place at the same time every single time. So I really thought Nemesis would behave more similar to that, but unfortunately, uh, he he is not like that. Yeah. Serial, what do you think of Nemesis really so far it. in the game? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't think, I don't think uh, Alex is wrong in that it just does feel like it defangs him a little bit. There's maybe one section where he's um, kind of chasing you as, like, as, uh, throughout rooms and stuff, and then when you go into the safe room, he just kind of sort of waits for you there but uh beyond that it just does seem like he is like he's more or less a cutscene that you're waiting to trigger at some point yeah um so so that's that does seem like 
Um, not what I was expecting, because I, I expected people saying like, oh yeah, because when Mr. X came out in uh, the two remake, people were saying that he's like Nemesis, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that does, that does, that did feel off to me when I when I played. Uh, but as someone who who was kind of like mixed on Mr. X in general in terms of how annoying he could be, uh, like I guess I didn't hate it as as much as a lot of people. But I do feel like playing through it. I enjoyed three, but I do feel like this is not maybe like if I was looking for here's a new way to experience that classic game. I don't know that this is is this is really the way that uh, it it was like it doesn't feel like um, that game. You know, it just feels like a new game that had that bears that same moniker. Yeah, it's tricky because, like, you know, I was texting with Tim Turry about it, and he's like, well, what do you think about the Nemesis fights? And I'm like, well, I mean, they're all intense. Like, every time Nemesis pops out, I know it's more scripted, a little bit more set pc but I'm also the type of person who gets a little bit numb during set pieces in games, like, even, like, Call of Duty set pieces. Like, ah, I'm just kind of going through the motions. It's, it's fine. I guess it's visually interesting. Um, but I felt like every time Nemesis popped out, my heart rate did explode. You know, like, it was intense every time in Resident Evil 3, even if it was a little more corralled than it was originally. But Kyle, what do you think about Nemesis so far? Uh, I think he's very cool and big, and his <laughs> tentacle is scary. I, it's interesting uh, to hear your uh, perspective, Alex, as someone who's like played it multiple times, because I'm, I'm definitely like, I'm playing this once. I don't really intend to play it more than once. Yeah. And in that sense of like, him showing up is just like, okay, really scary chase sequence right now. I just have to get out my shotgun and get from point A to point B. And like, I am really enjoying that. You know what I mean? I'm not thinking about like sort of the randomization elements of it or even comparing it to my original playthrough of the PlayStation game. And it does feel set PC, like absolutely. But like, it's like a set piece that I'm really enjoying and, and is like, you know, getting my heart rate up a little bit. And it's really exciting because like, it's less nemesis that I'm scared of and more just like the zombies who are in my way as I'm trying to get away from nemesis. And that part I'm like really enjoying, you know? Yeah. It is a weird feeling to <laughs> like, you can outrun nemesis most of the time. Like he jumps around, he, he grabs you every once in a while, but like, he's also just terrible at killing people. Like again, Kyle, we talked about it in the intro video, but just snap Jill's neck. That's all you have to do. Instead, he's just <laughs> punching her and then taking his time, loading up the rocket launcher and over again. It's like, it'd be so easy. Like, get out of the way. Let me do this, Nemesis. But then it is alarming when you're like running through those tight corridors and he's chasing you and then it's like, oh, suddenly four zombies pop up and it's like, okay, now here's secretly the real challenge because if one of them yeah. grabs me and I don't do that perfect dodge and the flash of light comes on the screen, which is so great, this is going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I like him so far. But I, I totally see what you're saying, Alex and Serial, of just like, he, he doesn't feel random, but he, he's still effective for me. I thought everything you've said, Alex, has been really interesting because this is my first time playing through. I didn't play through the original Resident Evil 3. And so I, I feel like the remake is kind of geared towards new new players and maybe maybe specifically people who played through the Resident Evil 2 remake for the first time and don't have that experience and I think part of that may be that's kind of it's just an easier less ambitious way to approach Resident Evil 3 not having to deal with all of the randomized elements and making you know multiple endings and stuff but just as a person playing through it for the first time I I enjoyed the entire experience through it. Um, I enjoyed the Nemesis. I, I noticed the same thing about Nemesis. Like these are obviously scripted encounters and this is when I'm supposed to be fighting him now. But as someone who, I think my last save file in Resident Evil 2 still has Mr. X like stalking right outside the safe room, just waiting for me there. Mm -hmm. it, it is less uh, anxiety inducing in that sense. But I do, I can I can definitely see your disappointment with it, and anyone who was well versed with the original Resident Evil Three not having those replay aspects. Because as soon as I I finished it the first time, I looked through it. You kind of open a shop that you can you can unlock different unlockable you know bonuses and stuff. But I really I don't have any you know motivation to go back and play through it again. I feel like I've gotten this experience. Yeah. Is One right. other thing that, that I feel is maybe a little bit shallow is that, like, uh, as much as it, it is very different, I, like, the, the RE engine is so good in that, like, it's a just great looking, looking at game. these environments in, in the RE engine looks so good. Uh, and just walking around, I, I, I enjoyed, like, the early parts of the game where you're walking around the, like, the city and it's, like, kind of raining and you see, like, the, the signs for different stories and stuff. I think that that stuff looks 
fantastic. Uh, and then later on, I was kind of disappointed that, you know, it's like the thing that you do in those games, but you eventually go, it, it does the thing that a lot of Resident Evil games do where they go down the more traditional Resident Evil environments, you know, without spoiling anything. But I like that it, that the first portion of the game doesn't take place in like a series of hallways and like interiors, right? It, you're more outside, which I, which I thought was like a really cool change of pace. Yeah. I was struck by uh, how relatively easy the game is. Like, I, I am no Resident Evil expert, uh, but, like, I finished the game with plenty of ammo throughout. Like, I barely was scraping by. I had first, eight, like, uh, you know, uh, herbs up the butt. Uh, like, it was just... Are you supposed to eat those, Hanson? Excuse me? Yeah. Uh, he was trying. Your butt. <laughs> I was shocked, though. Like, I feel like the beauty of Resident Evil 2's remake is, like, it felt perfectly designed for... Oh my god, I have no ammo left. I'm f***ed and then barely squeezing by again and again and again. And even in like having situations where it's like, okay, this room over here is f***ed. I need to just dodge that as much as possible. And I felt like with Resident Evil 3's remake, I wasn't that scared overall, but then also like I felt like I was fine. Like I didn't really worry about unloading ammo at any point. I feel like I can kill everything in the game easily and the game will just keep handing me ammo. So if you're a big Resident Evil fan, like I would recommend playing it on a higher difficulty out of the gate. Yeah, honestly for me the hardest part was uh there was there was a Nemesis battle where the hardest part for me wasn't killing Nemesis because I did that multiple times while I was retrying. It was I'm the guy I'm the kind of guy who wants to turn all those red blue uh, red rooms into blue. So it was more about like, oh, I'm full on a- on ammo as I'm facing this guy. How can I waste the proper amount of ammo <laughs> so I can get everything in this room before I kill him? That's so and that was like that was the biggest challenge, like the self-made challenge was like the, the most I struggled with that game was just like, okay, I got to use these three acid rounds because there are acid rounds here. So I can just replace <laughs> those. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, other than that, I felt like I... I like even later on, they introduce some like more uh, aggressive enemies, and even then, it was just like as soon as this person comes into the room, I have more than enough resources to just completely obl- obliterate them and not make them m- much of a threat. Yeah, I don't care how big they are, but okay, <laughs> remind me, Alex, were those pale heads in the original? Because I say that it wasn't scary overall. Those pale head enemies towards the end of the game scared the hell out of me. I was petrified of those things. Like genuinely jumped every time I saw one. I just hated them. Hmm. Um, they were not. Okay. Uh, I mean, there, there were. Well, I, I have to. I'd have to ask what the designers had in mind when they made the pale heads. But uh, the the original Resident Evil games had nude zombies in them, right. uh, and they're usually stronger and faster than clothed zombies <laughs> for for one reason or another. And they usually only at the end. So I imagine the pale heads uh, were are a bit of an offshoot of that. Uh, and yeah, they're basically stronger zombies that regenerate. Uh, but they were actually, inter- interestingly enough, uh, Resident Evil 2 Remake got one piece of DLC. It was very minor. Uh, no no consequences on the story, but the Pale Heads actually appeared in that DLC. It was called Ghost Survivors. Oh. And, and uh, when, when, when Ghost Survivors came out, we thought that was kind of an interesting uh, addition, but we were wondering why that wasn't in the main game, and I, I guess we found out that that was kind of a test run for their implementation in uh, Resident Evil Three. So, right. What? Um, I mean, I think I think they're, they're they're similar to the regenerators from RE Four. Yes. Do you remember what those creatures were? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they sure. don't have quite the same behavior, but they have the same kind of vibe to them, and. I think they're cool enemies. Yeah. What do you know about the development of Resident Evil 3? Because it was co-developed by a studio outside of Capcom. Is that right? Uh, no comment, I guess. You know uh, something about this? Well, I guess, I mean, I've heard, I've heard, I mean, there are rumors out there uh, that, that kind of discuss the circumstances of how, I guess the studio M2 was started up and, uh, we do have confirmation from the game's credits that it was started by uh, Tatsuya Minami, the old president of Platinum, who worked at Capcom before then. So, oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't officially know the M2 story. I've heard I've heard things, you know, every now and then about how you know that that studio came to be, but 
I guess that's unless that information becomes public, I'd rather not say anything. Okay, and you got your ear to the ground. Oh, you're actually in Tokyo. I guess yeah. we haven't acknowledged it throughout this podcast yet, but uh, you're mm-hmm. basically yeah living in the world of Resident Evil, surrounded by rumors just swirling around you at all times. Yeah, uh, I mean, a lot of them seem to find their way out there. So. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, any other big but takeaways? I would, say, oh. I would say, just to answer your question, sorry, um, I, I would say, yeah, um, not, not just M2, but I think when I saw the credits, another Capcom subsidiary called K2 uh, was also heavily involved. And uh, K2, um, like on the Capcom website, K2 is listed as a subsidiary. And so it's not technically within the company, but they seem to have had a big role in the development of RE3. I think they also developed um, the Not a Hero DLC of Resident Evil 7. Oh, okay. So, yeah, whereas if I look at the credits of Resident Evil 2 Remake, a lot of that seems more Capcom Division uh, R&D 1 proper. Right. And I don't think there's, I mean, visually, I think Resident Evil 3 looks amazing. I think like the camera work and camera transitions are really stunning, especially in that opening sequence. I think they're incredibly well done. So I don't think, it's not fair to say development wise, it's a huge step down. That said, and I was playing on like a pre-release version on PC, but I did like, it did crash a couple times for me. So maybe that'll be ironed out in the public version. So everything with a grain of salt, but on PC, it was, it was struggling every once in a while here. Uh, Anybody else have any tech issues throughout the game? No, it was fine on Xbox. Oh, okay. Oh, great. I didn't run into anything. Yeah, I so. didn't have any. I, I didn't run into any crashes either. Great. Uh, any other big yeah, takeaways? Try console gaming, Hanson. Oh, is that the place to be? <laughs> I'll be damned. Well, uh, I mean, I played it on PC and it was fine. I don't know. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, damn. Maybe it's my I PC. My joke. Uh, but yeah, any other big takeaways we haven't gotten to yet for, for, uh, for Resident Evil Three? Great music, I think. Oh yeah. I don't know how we all felt, but yeah, I'm glad was... they they did good stuff with the music. Was the original so synthy? I I don't remember it being so like '80s Romero kind of live, you know, Night of the or Day of the Dead oh, kind of. It's very the original is very melodic. There are a lot of interesting uh, melodic themes playing, and a lot of them are rearranged in the remake, which is good because Resident Evil Two kind of took a very iconic soundtrack and basically threw it out yeah. for something that I did not think was anywhere near as good. So I'm glad that they kind of did an about face in that direction and stuck more to the original material. It's a great soundtrack, I think. So Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I like it too. I also, a little touch, I, just like an Easter egg, I loved breaking into the toy store and they had the big, like, original North American Mega Man box art, like, toy yeah. mm. uh, set up. They had the huge statue and all those little ones. I was like, oh, that's fun. That is very it takes fun. Me out, takes me out of the world a little bit here, but I'm happy to leave for a moment just to be like, oh, they've created a model of that absurd Mega Man character. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, he's in the, what was it, Tekken Cross Street Fighter? Was he yeah, in there, sir? Yeah, as a, yeah, as a playable Cross fighter. Ah, yeah. uh, that's what it is, of course. Um, so, uh, Alex, uh, the future of Resident Evil. Uh, there were rumors swirling that 2021, there's going to be some future entry that's going to be um, much uh, argued about and it's going to be a bit of a departure again. Um, What do you think of those rumors and what do you want? What do I think of those rumors? Yeah. Uh, Oh, man. Uh, I feel like there has been a reasonable degree of accuracy with regards to Resident Evil rumors for the past few years. So, I mean, if... If you like to play the probability game, then I, I would imagine that um, it will be true to some extent. I would imagine Capcom's always kind of looking to uh, mix things up a bit. I imagine the next game wouldn't be a remake. Uh, and it has been three years since Resident Evil 3 came out. And usually seven, the gap, nine. the longest... Sorry, Resident Evil 3, Resident Evil 7. Yeah, it's been three years yeah, since Resident Evil 7 came out. So... Uh, I feel like we are coming up to the point where we should be seeing uh, another, or a Resident Evil 8, if that's what we're going to call it. And, you know, if Capcom wants to stick to the first person uh, that was in RE7 to kind of keep things fresh, then I think uh, that makes a lot of sense as well, because you don't want to have the same kind of game three times in a row, three years in a row. I think that can that can get really stale, and that's actually, I think, what happened to Resident Evil in the late 90s, early 2000s when they were releasing derivative games at that point. So, I mean, I hope if, if they do make a, a Resident Evil 8, 
I would like to be surprised. I would like to have my expectations defied because that's what I loved about Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil 2. Yeah. Uh, I felt like I, I came in with certain expectations. I tried to keep them reasonable. And Resident Evil 7 blew me away because I was so surprised at all the visual implementation in that game and how the game kind of played out. And it wasn't something I imagined, but I loved it. Resident Evil 2 was very similar where I kind of knew what to expect story-wise, but the way everything was rearranged and polished and visually beautiful was also something beyond my expectations. With RE3, I feel like nothing really came close to wowing me. Like I never had that jaw-dropping moment when playing RE3. So I hope the future of Resident Evil does have more jaw-dropping things that things that make you go holy sh. Right. I can't believe they did that. And yeah. that those are my favorite types of Resident Evil games. Yeah. The um we haven't touched on it, but Resident Evil Resistance, the 4v1 asymmetrical multiplayer mode is also packed in here. I just played the tutorials. I couldn't find any matches for the for the preview build at least. Um, but I know there's an open beta out there and stuff. Has anybody other than Alex played any of Resistance? Okay, great. Uh, the no, floor is the, yours, the Alex. The beta got delayed. Like PlayStation was having problems, and yeah, so mm. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how even playable it is right this second to begin with. It's but. unpleasant. I, I had oh. to wait thirty minutes for a match to begin uh, on Steam earlier. So Perfect. I actually really like the concept. You okay. know, I feel like it's 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 Resident Evil. It, it's it's the closest Resident Evil is probably ever going to get to Super Mario Maker. In that you can kind of manipulate the environment and choose where to put zombies. Uh, and I, I like the idea a lot. It's just that because it's so dependent on an online infrastructure and it's, it's Capcom's first time implementing online multiplayer into the RE engine, uh, I feel like there are definitely going to be a lot of rough patches, uh, especially presentation-wise. When I played the beta, there's a lot of latency as well. Mm. So you're used to when you're shooting zombies in RE2 and RE3, you know, those bullets land and it's very perceptible and you can kind of measure the, t- the, the amount of damage you're doing. But in resistance, it's kind of a cluster, actually. <laughs> like there's so much latency, at least in the beta, that you don't know sure. if your shots are landing or if they're actually like hurting the enemy. So, right. Well, I mean, you talk about measuring the damage. It's the first time in Resident Evil, as far as I know, where they actually have the numbers of damage on the screen. So mm-hmm. there you go. Right. And we, we in, in the group I was with earlier, like the numbers weren't showing up for me, but apparently it was doing oh. some damage. So I don't know if that's a bug or if, if it only shows numbers in certain situations. Okay, but Alex, what's but your prediction? Said, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry? I was going to say, prediction, uh, like years from now, will there be the Resident Evil Resistance Defense Force of being like, actually... That mode was pretty sweet. You people didn't give it a chance. Oh, man. I feel like every every Resident Evil has a force. Yeah. Whether it's... I've seen them for Gun Survivor. I've seen them for Gaiden. I've seen what them about? for Operation Raccoon City. RE6 that... especially has a very potent defense force. <laughs> Operation so... Raccoon City was the one that I was going to bring up. I was like, you know, I don't see a lot of people talking about that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, probably not. Uh, but I think there, I mean, it's obviously a very experimental experience and that's why Capcom's not selling the game by itself. Right. Uh, And I think that's, that's the right way to approach it. They're not even building it into RE3 itself. It's just its own separate launcher on your, on your game console. So, you know, you have, you have nothing to lose except potentially your time. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And who cares about that? We have nothing but time in this time. But, uh, yeah, Yeah, I I feel like overall this is the most downer conversation we've had on the podcast for a game that I really had a good time playing. Like, I feel like I, Alex, I mean, despite your qualms, it's like you my had, fault. Yeah. No, it's fine. I, I, we appreciate your expert opinion, but at the same time, it's like, I just want to reiterate, like I had a fun time playing this. I don't, Jeff, um, yeah, yeah. I think, I think we have perfectly explained the, the range of review scores yeah. here because I do, I, I came, like I said, I came from it without any experience with Resident Evil 3. And to me, it was a great, even if it's a little more streamlined and a little more action focused follow up to Resident Evil 2. And I liked it for those reasons, but I can totally understand if you are a fan of that. And personally, I also would like 
to have seen that kind of that replayability and those random elements that you could trigger from the original one in there. And so if you're coming as a big fan and you like the more experimental aspects of the original, then I can totally understand why you're disappointed because of that. But if you're looking for, you know, almost a more uncharted style, you know, scripted experience, then I can, then, you know, that's why I enjoyed it. Yeah. You are all unworthy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. No, no I, that's completely I, fair. I completely you no know, recognize, and I uh, can respect the fact that people have different experiences with the Resident Evil series. And I do think Resident Evil Three is a great game, and I still think it's worth playing uh, because, in spite of all the changes, it's entertaining. And I think it, 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 it especially in these times, you know, it, it feels good to just, you know, play something that won't stress you out too much. And 100%. you can have a lot of fun. Uh, RE3 is kind of a metaphor for life right now. And it's, it's really weird, especially when you watch the opening scene and you, you, how many, how many parallels can you draw with real life right now? You know, I, it opens with live action probably. coverage of a pandemic. Like it's it's pretty it's spreading like, faster than any other in history. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Right. Well, hey, uh, yeah. CVX Freak, uh, which is your Twitter handle. Do you want to give yourself a plug, even if it's just that Twitter handle again? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at yeah at CVX Freak. Uh, you can uh, yeah just ever if anyone ever wants to hit me up, that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, yeah, that's my. Instagram name as well. Uh, I have a website, same URL, cvxfreak.com. I don't update it very often, but uh, I do have a few things on there that I usually talk about with Resident Evil. Gotcha. And Kyle, just in case you're confused, that's Code Veronica X Freak. Specifically. Oh, I thought, yeah. big, I thought you were a big fan of CVS, the pharmacy. Mm. <laughs> the hardcore It is option. not Castlevania. It is not... <laughs> um, <laughs> It is not coronavirus, for that matter. Oh, hey, that oh, helps. Geez, yeah. uh, well, hey, uh, <laughs> get, out. Thank, get out of here. Thank you yeah, so Code much, Veronica Alex. Veronica was... Oh, sorry, yeah. Code I was going to say... my first Resident Evil game, so that's the name. That's where the name comes from. I know gotcha. you love it. But hey, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll now let you go to sleep over there in Tokyo. And this is silly, but would you mind clapping as your exit? Just clapping once. Bye. Hey, the clap you just heard was another guest teleporting in. Uh, everybody else is still here. Very, very honored to be joined by special guest David Sims from the Blank Check Podcast. Hey, guys. Oh, my Woo! God. That's him. It's fantastic. That's the thing he says. <laughs> he always says that. Blank Check he is my says, hey guys. It's my favorite uh, movie podcast. Like I found it, I guess, a couple years ago, and it is just like, uh, just to kiss your ass a little bit before we get talking Mario here, just a little bit, is like, it is the perfect podcast formula where you listen to it, you're clearly a lot smarter about films than I am, than a majority of your listeners are. At the same time, it's just like between your personality, Griffin's personality, and producer Ben's, I've never had a podcast click faster for like, oh, I understand the personalities of these three guys. They're not shoving like, this is who I am down your throat, but just like, <laughs> you get it, and then you're hooked. That's very nice of you to say. Okay. I, I, I appreciate it. But much like we do uh, the deepest dives, which is kind of like our community game clubs and kind of go through uh, different games in exhaustive detail. That's what Blank Check does for directors. And you just started one on George Miller, right? Yes, yes. We just started our George Miller series. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited to have an excuse to watch Happy Feet 2. <laughs> hey, it's a weird one. I'll, I'm not going to say more, but that's an interesting one to watch. Good, good. <laughs> I've seen the first Happy Feet. Love it. Never watched the second one. Going to watch it now. All right. Good call. Uh, we're here because you're always teasing... Uh, what a huge Mario fan you are. I feel like you've been teasing fans mm-hmm. for a long time now with maybe I'll start a video game podcast. Maybe I'll talk about Mario uh, in some capacity. And so now there's a lot of rumors bubbling about Mario's 35th anniversary. It seems like Eurogamer and VGC, everybody's reconfirming each other's sources and triple checking it that it seems like Nintendo is going all out this year with Mario Celebration. And it was going to be revealed at E3 that there's a bunch of re-releases and remasters coming out a lot of surprises along the way uh hey uh david sims what's your history with mario um i would guess well my history is that my cousin i think the first game i ever played was my cousin had uh an nes and i would play 
Super Mario Brothers in her basement with her, probably from the age of five or something like that. So pretty much the first video game for me and probably true for a lot of people, right? Yeah. Is it uh, your favorite series, you think? It probably has to be. I, it feels sort of, I mean, I guess, I guess Zelda could make a run at it, I guess. Okay. I, I do have a fondness for Resident Evil, but there's nothing more sort of consistent and nothing more like, you know, constantly exciting than a new Mario game. Is there any piece of entertainment that's as consistent as the Mario series? I mean, for 35 years, it is pretty absurd. I'm talking like mainline entries. I'm trying to think of just consistent releases that always knocks it out of the park at this level. It's got to be on its own. Probably, right? In terms of I mean, again, like sheer quantity, too, in terms of yeah. how many games they've released. I, I yeah. mean, I guess you could say, you could say Zelda. I guess Zelda would right, be but, the competitor. Yeah, but Mario's longer, certainly. Mm-hmm. You know, even if it's not by much. Maybe like the Winter Olympics, always solid every yeah. year. Yeah. Especially uh, once Sonic got involved, that's definitely bumped it up good. a notch, no doubt. Uh, so here's the actual report here. So Eurogamer uh, says uh, the report states that Nintendo will release quote most of Super Mario's 35 year back catalog this year, remastered for the Nintendo Switch. Uh, Eurogamer sources confirm that it's. Mario Galaxy, 64, and Sunshine. Uh, Eurogamer sources have also confirmed that a new Paper Mario is in the works, along with a deluxe version of Super Mario 3D World from the Wii U, which will include an array of new levels. It's uh, it's going to be overwhelming. Obviously, that Paper Mario thing is very exciting, especially because there are previous rumors that it's going to be kind of a return to form, that Intelligent Systems is going back to kind of the design of the first two Paper Marios, which I would argue are some of the greatest games ever made. Um, but... With finally all these 3D Mario games in theory releasing, maybe somewhere around the realm of when the 35th anniversary would be, which is September 13th uh, this year, uh, the great question emerges of what is the best 3D Mario game. Uh, so, David Sims. Yes. What do you think is the best 3D Mario game ever made? There's a right answer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh god damn! Wait, there's a right answer. 100. Oh, we what all were talking wrong? about it. That I was think the me and Hanson hour. have the same answer. Maybe we'll see. Hmm. Um. Well, I will say then that uh, for me it would be between uh, 64 and Galaxy. Okay. 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 Any reaction to that? Good job. Good job. And <laughs> Not outrageous. I. I. <laughs> I mean, is it boring? I think I have to pick 64. Well, this is this is the problem, David, because like we were all at Game Informer for a thousand years, and every time you're making a list or any sort of ranking, everybody jumps in with opinions before it's ever made clear, what are we actually talking about here? So, Jeff, would you like to set the table? What are we trying to make the, this list based on? We don't know. We haven't, we haven't discussed that. Is it the best game? Is it the most influential or important in history? You know? Right. I mean, how, how much does the historical anger f- angle factor into it? I think it should be what's important now, which is going to be when these games release on the Nintendo Switch, maybe this year, however this whole thing rolls out, like what can you have the most fun playing? Right? So you're saying, so this is a most fun argument. That's where I'm leaning. I say f- history, but I don't know where everybody else stands. Fun. All right. Great, we got a fun. Okay, so on a pure fun basis, David Sims, still going 64 or Galaxy? See, I fun is crucial, but I mean, <laughs> I do appreciate like sort of thematic qualities to these games, even though they're, you know, obviously often very simple tales. But I, I think, I think I'm still going to stump for 64 slightly over Galaxy. That would probably be my one and two. Yeah, I was thinking about. Do you think 64 is just the best soundtrack? It has to be, right? Compared that, to all the 3D worlds? It's it's the most like haunting and strange of the games. I mean, if you're going by the metric of like as you say, like when all these if the, all these games are suddenly available to me on my Switch and I can just pick and choose from any of them. I think I would play 64 first. Yeah, it's the one that I'm the most curious about like seeing how they revamp it what it actually looks like how much they're going to i mean if it's a full-on remake using like mario odyssey's assets which they already you know kind of dip their toes into the water a little bit kyle you shake your head a little bit on that one well i mean i don't think it'll be that i mean but they they do have a precedent for that with the super mario all-stars on super nintendo where they like you know upgraded Mm. all the the levels and stuff and then there's also the question of there's the the ds one that added like wario and yoshi 
and uh, Peach as like playable characters and oh. stuff and added new stars. I think they added like 30 new stars. Yeah. We got to like, add the tuss, those uh, touch controls too. Yeah, yeah it's going to be crucial on the Switch for the handheld version. I mean, but I, th- I, th- I think it'll be like, I think it'll just be an HD version of the 64 one. I don't think, I think that like, I don't think Nintendo's interested in like changing out the character models or anything like that, you know? Yeah, but, but it's weird when that's going to be on the Switch and they have at least like the outside castle area from Odyssey already recreated, but I think that's maybe yeah. too much. But look, Nintendo's got a gazillion dollars, right? They, yeah. could, they could afford and, to have spent a couple years making this full remake of 64. And also, by the way, David, I'm so sorry to break it to you, but the correct answer was Super Mario Galaxy. That is <laughs> yeah, the best I mean, Mario game, period. I, I think that if you're going by like purely objective, like sort of marrying like gameplay, you know, innovation, just uh, like that is that is probably number one. I think I have, I cannot avoid my nostalgia for 64 and my of sort of like sort of strange love of the weird empty castle. <laughs> uh, Serial Vasquez, you're a champion for Galaxy 2 over Galaxy yeah. 1. Why is that? I, I think they, obviously it builds a lot on Galaxy's, you know, fundamental basis of like, hey, we're going to turn every platform into like this round sphere. It's going to be like this interesting mix of like traditional tra- platforming and this kind of new experience that you hadn't seen before. But I think uh, between all the suits they add, like there's a suit where you like, create your own platforms with clouds and like just a bunch and adding uh, Yoshi in and, and creating a bunch of challenges around that. Uh, I think it ha- probably has like the most diverse level design of any Mario game. And, um, and it was, that was just like this weird game where like every other level you just saw this new idea uh, like that felt like, Oh man, they, they could have done so much more with this other concept that I was just exploring, but they've already decided to introduce something new into the mix. And so uh, I, I think there's a, there's something to be said about the the hub in Galaxy that I really like in yeah. the original one, um, but in terms of like here's just some really well crafted levels. I think from beginning to end, Galaxy is probably the most consistent in terms of like, or Galaxy Two is the most consistent in like giving you something new to play around with in every level, basically. Yeah, you talk about like the variety. It is wild thinking about like the development history of Galaxy 2, where it was like, well, there are a lot of ideas we couldn't quite squeeze into Galaxy 1, didn't fit any sort of themes that we were going for. So let's just bundle all that stuff together and put it in Galaxy 2. And it's like, yeah, that's all people want from a Mario game. It's just like the level of variety. I mean, there is something about having a sense of place. I hear you with like a 64 or just to mention the, the, the name here, Sunshine hasn't been brought up. But, you know, like having a certain distinct vibe, I think is interesting for Mario. But at its core, I think people just want that constant variety, which is why I even love, you know, stuff like 3D Land or 3D World, where there's not like a concrete sense of place, but in terms of just great platforming and amazing art design, like that's it. Uh, Jeffem, you've been quiet. What do you think about this whole thing? Yeah, I was. I'm just gonna say Galaxy was gonna be mine, but I haven't played Galaxy Two or Sunshine, so honestly, and I also really liked might, Odyssey. Might be- yeah, it, it seemed like everyone. It's. It seemed like there was a weird kind of counter movement against Odyssey as just being not as great as previous Mario games. I guess. I guess when you. When you're judging everything against the legacy of Mario, then I guess I could see how maybe that was a disappointment. But I, I did everything you could in that game and had a super fun time. Yeah, no, I hear you for sure. So uh, we had a community Twitter poll here. Um, what do y'all think? One out of Mario 64, Mario Galaxy, 3D World, or Odyssey? What do you think the Min Max community preferred out of that batch? I think we skew younger, so I think it's going to go like, I think it's Galaxy. Oh, interesting. Uh, Mario Galaxy and Mario Odyssey are tied at 28.7%, but 64 took it. But then I had to have a follow-up poll because everybody was screaming about the lack of sunshine. So between Sunshine, Galaxy 2, and 3D Land, which do you think won, Kyle? I'm sorry, what were the the choices again? Sunshine, Galaxy 2, and 3D Land. Sunshine, Galaxy 2, and 3D Land. I, I mean, I guess Sunshine has this weird campaign for it. So I think Sunshine probably. I'm sorry, it's Galaxy 2, you fool. Oh, I don't know what you're thinking. I mean, that's the right choice. There is. I, oh, go ahead, Kyle. Like, I just, I just quickly, like, I, it's, I feel like I've weirdly come out like negative. Like, ah, it's Sunshine, Mario 64. Like, I freaking adore Mario 64. That game makes me so happy. Like, from that nostalgia angle, like, just, just walking around that opening area just makes me smile. But I will say, like, in terms of all the 3D Marios, which I love, Sunshine is the weakest for me. It is the only one that I didn't 100%. Um, and I also, someone pointed out a good, uh, a, a, or posed a good question of, how is it going to work without the the GameCube um, 
trigger analog weapons. triggers. Yeah, because there's like yeah. multiple levels of spray, and I don't know how they're gonna translate that to switch. It's God. Could they do well? Like tilt or something. Like you hold on the trigger and then you like tilt a little bit more, even like with the Joy Cons or something silly like that. I don't know. I mean, I guess you could hold down, you know, Z1 and or R1 and R2. I guess, I don't know. That's their problem to solve. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It seems like with Sunshine, it's one of those games that I just remember the GameSpot review was really low back in the day. I think it was probably like Gersman reviewing it or something. So it, it figures. So I always had this in my mind. They're like, oh, I know that one isn't that great. And then it wasn't until I was in college that I actually went back and played that. And I had an absolute blast. It's one of those that like. It's, it's great. It's it's just, it's super hard to me. I feel like it's the hardest 3D Mario. Hmm. I would yeah. agree with that. Yeah? yeah. Oh, what's your experience with Sunshine there, David Sims? I mean, I was a, a devoted GameCube owner, and so I was sort of I was that I was I resisted the PlayStation for so long, so I was by the GameCube, which is sort of my last gasp with being Nintendo only. I was all in, and I do think Sunshine is, I guess, like you're saying, it's like the weird culty one where it, <laughs> it doesn't quite fit in. It's 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 a bit of a redheaded stepchild, but like. The you know the the gameplay with the flood with the the hover it it, it, it could be pretty inventive. I don't think I ever completed a hundred percent of it either though. Yeah, yeah, it is the flood mechanic. It's like this beautiful marriage of Mario and Yoshi in a way. Like I love any platformer that has a little bit of like the jump and then the ability to hover a little bit, like Yoshi's Island, just mwah, beautiful. And so you have like right. adding that through the flood to Mario's basic skill set. I miss it at times, you know. It's a beautiful thing. Um, okay, so when, Kyle, these are released on the Switch, which will be the first one you boot up? You know, I think it'll still be Galaxy, even though I did plug in the Wii U and play the first uh, few levels of Galaxy like two weeks ago. Really? Um, yeah, but it was because like, um, it was for Mario Day, and I just made this little Twitter video like uh, about like why Galaxy was my favorite, but I still think that's the one I would beeline to, because that's the one... like it's it's been a long time before or even since the release of galaxy that like uh, my mind has been blown so much because they basically took the standard you know the platform which is integral to the platformer and they tweaked that in a huge way and that just like that the way that the, the fact that you could long jump into orbit <laughs> is just like incredible like that that yeah. that to me was like the that's one of the reasons why like as much as I really adore Odyssey and love Odyssey, it, like what Jeffem was talking about, like I didn't, it, it's it, it didn't feel like as innovative after Galaxy, you know. Um, so and that's why it was like it, it, it's like slightly negative towards that one when it came out. It was like I really love this game, I hundred percented it, it's great, but it didn't it didn't innovate as much as Galaxy for me. You know? Odyssey had a T Rex though, Kyle. That's yeah. true, and he was less that's fun that's to control than Mario himself. So right, yeah, it's a little change in the edges. Rex with a mustache. <laughs> that is, I can't deny that. That is true. That is factual. Yeah. Uh, the weird thing about Galaxy, obviously brilliant. I think one of the greatest games we've ever made. But I feel like last time we went back and played that, I feel like everybody will go back to Mario Galaxy and go back to their save and go through the levels and have a great time. But like starting a fresh game, I'm curious if your take was the same on this, Kyle. That like there's a lot more kind of bullshit story in Galaxy <laughs> than you remember. Yeah. You find yourself yeah. going through a lot of like, okay, Rosalina, Luma, got it, 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 got it. It, it really, it brings it down in my mind a couple notches. You know what game doesn't really have that? Yeah. Galaxy 2. That's true. Honestly, I think that's maybe why I prefer Galaxy 2. It doesn't have quite as much of a lore setup of what's happening on this thing. Yeah, you're just on a Mario head spaceship and you just go from <laughs> level to level. It's it's awesome. <laughs> There's all those characters that just say, don't worry about it. Don't think yeah. about it too much. It's fine. <laughs> The, uh, the weird thing is with this report talking about how there are multiple new games in the works, and so it's unclear if they're talking about the new Paper Mario and then the deluxe version of Super Mario 3D World, which I am looking forward to. I love that game a lot. Um, or do you think that they're going to cap all this off with Super Mario Odyssey 2, which we've talked about before in the podcast? Or is that just too much Mario? It, you got to stop. Talked about this with you before, Hanson. We're not going to see Odyssey 2 this year. <laughs> so you think like the multiple games that they're talking about in these reports, that that's what that is? Is just Paper Mario and Deluxe Super Mario 3D World? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. they, that's yeah. they've been able to get away with the, the Wii U to uh, switch ports for a while now. So And this is one that I actually want. I love 3D World, so I would love to be able to play that on my Switch. And getting all these other games, I, I think, is 
their their plans for that and then like the lego set and i guess there's like isn't there that theme park as well well that, who knows now but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, i mean and it was in it was in the well. cards right but um i think all of that they can get away with saying like this is how we're going to celebrate the especially if they release that new paper mario game which would be pretty cool oh my god it'd be very exciting yeah you mentioned yeah. the illumination film yeah oh david have you heard i mean what do you think of that like illumination handling a, a mario movie i mean they are they are a a logical match in that I feel like they had that kind of sort of clean cartoony visual style that Mario has gravitated towards since he became a 3d person. Uh, I've never loved an illumination movie. They tend to be pretty, you know, sort of C plus B minus like you know, they, they, they sort of stay in their lane almost a little too much. I also have no idea I mean, like, I love the the live action Bob Hoskins insane, terrible Super Mario Brothers movie, but I love it because it's trying to make sense of a world that does not like fit into like a sort of cinematic lane at all. Like, so I, I, I I'm just always a little resistant to like trying to explain the world of Mario like in a detailed way. So I, that is my concern with that movie. Like, what 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 will its take be? Yeah, and I feel like just the coming from usually the better. Yeah, yeah, and coming with, like, with the Minions experience, like, okay, maybe if a studio is going to be so bold as to not have a lot of speaking and explanation, like maybe Illumination is a decent fit for that. But, all right, uh, what, is your, what is your prediction, though, David? Do you think that Mario will say more than his basic lines? Like, will he actually speak in a meaningful way in this film? I do, God. That, that, let me see. That's eerie. Even you saying that sent like a chill down my spine. Like, ah, <laughs> but like, who would voice this? him even? Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> supposedly Miyamoto has like a major, you know, uh, hand in the creative guidance of this thing, which like I feel like is a line they tried with the original movie, and <laughs> later he revealed like my only like I, I had no, I had nothing to say there. Um, but. uh like that, the, what you're saying is exactly what alarms me. Like I, I, he's going to talk. Like it, there's going to is there going to be like character dynamics? Like it, I'm just it, the, the whole point of Mario is that it's like very clean, simple archetype. Right. And mm. you know, even a 90 minute movie is going to have to expand on that. Well, yeah. he, he's a vessel for jumping, and then and the whole point yes. of a movie is for us to empathize with with that. You know, th- for there to be like an emotional denouement at the end of a Mario movie where it's like, you know what? I really felt for Mario and Luigi at the end of that one. I think it's just absurd in every sense. Right. Well, maybe though, just to pull from uh, what you're what you've been immersed in, maybe they just pull like a Fury Road and it's just like zooming out is just the simplest idea of Mario rescuing Peach and then they can pack mm. in some twists and turns and fun adventures and exploration along the way. Like, I don't think they need to make it overly complicated. There's a path forward here. They're probably dropped. Okay. All right. We'll see. Um, David Sims, uh, I appreciate on the yep. Link Check podcast every time that uh, you make a video game reference. I know it's so stupid that, hey, you're a younger guy, and it's just stupid to still be amazed. We're like, what? These people that know movies, they also play video games? So thank you for every time you drop a hot reference in there. Of course, and I will do my video game podcast. I mean, I don't know how to do what I sort of was thinking about now that uh, people aren't allowed to go to each other's houses, but I'll figure something out. I want to talk more video games. I've been playing them since I was a wee lad, and they are a long time and ongoing obsession of mine. Yeah, so the talk for a while was reviewing every Mario level. I think you said that at some point. I, I want to do... All right, Super Mario Please. World is the best video game of all time. Okay. And I want to do it world mm-hmm. by world. Level by level is too crazy. But I want to talk about it thematically rather than from a gameplay aspect, because I am not, you know, I, I'm not qualified enough to talk about it from sort of a design perspective, but... That's that's what I want to do. We'll see. We'll see how I can figure that out. Okay. I'm glad we finally got someone else on this podcast that recognizes Super Mario World is the best game. <laughs> that's <laughs> the best game. That's the best one. Thank you. There's a thing called Final Fantasy VII. It seems three. good. You said better than three, David. Better than three. What's the argument? It's no. I mean, you got <laughs> <more> <laughs> hours, all right. It's got, it is. It's it, the world build. It's it's a world building thing. Here, wait, when you unlock the key, it makes a little ring noise, and it's like the the keyhole closes in. All right, like that's all you need for a game. Yeah, it's very specific. Did he get so angry that he left. What did I say? I think how he actually, dare you mention Mario Three on this. Podcast? He jumped out of the window of his apartment. I do believe. <laughs> 
very oh, okay. unclear. He got the right my, my doorbell. My doorbell was ringing, which is a very unusual event these days. And it was Miyamoto thanking you for your service through all these years. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, that's fantastic. Well, hey, uh, you're I mean, welcome. Do, oh, go ahead, quick, Kyle. Hanson, I mean, do we want to get a quick ranking, like uh, from David, like because that was kind all of right. a yeah. Go a for it. Do, here, right? do you have a sure. ranking for the 3D Mario game, sir? Okay, Sticking I with think 3D, I would go probably. this way. Yeah, I think I go. 64 number one, and I, that's another one where I can expand on it for a long time. Then Galaxy 1 and 2 are, would be my next two. Tied? Then I, no, I mean, one first, then two. Just, okay. just, just okay. because of, again, just sort of like innovation. You know, one, one is a little more of the, the milestone there. Right. But although I do appreciate the argument of like two is simpler plot-wise, which is sort of, sort of a bonus. Then I think I would put odyssey then i guess i you know what i'll put sunshine over 3d world and land 3d world and land are games that i've only played like once you know and and never got too deep into i think i basically completed both but they i have the least relationship with them and even though sunshine is so strange and flawed like i do i have a little more of a soft spot for it yeah all right we'll take it as the official ranking congratulations everybody we all really did it uh (laughs) Let's see, David Sims, uh, we do something here called The Deepest Dive, which is our game clubs. Uh, if we ever do Mario World, uh, we'll definitely uh, bug yes. you again at some point. Please. Okay, great. And please... Mario World, Deus Ex, the original. <laughs> what else? I'm trying to think of games that I could just talk about all day. Uh, anyway, uh, Resident Evil 4, of course. Oh, oh absolutely. No, yeah. yeah, where do you stand in The Last of Us? Love the lot. Of course. Great. Masterpiece. Okay. okay. Maybe we'll bug you for that one in the future. But all right. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, please check out Blank Check. Uh, if you've never listened to it before, you'll be amazed by their knowledge. But Mr. David Sims, uh, would you want to then clap out, sir? Oh, sure. I will clap out. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes. Let me lay my microphone on the table because my stand is still in the mail. And now it's back to the love between us. Just... <laughs> Just the cohorts sitting in their houses, uh, getting to know each other. Four a little, little bit cohorts sitting in their houses. Anyways, the friends. C O D C A S T I N G. Thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, good job. Is a game that released on the Nintendo Switch uh, last week. It was Shadow Dropped with the Nintendo Direct Mini, which uh, it was one of those things where like, oh, it looks cool. It kind of looks like the Portal tutorial style where it's kind of stickmen and stuff um and looked a little bit job simulator-esque where it's very physics-y very silly and then it's kind of a puzzle game we're piecing stuff together we played it for the great goatee hunt um this last week so if you want to watch us stream the first hour of it, you can check it out there but um show those games that it, i think it is a real chance of going under the radar this year because it seems very cool and it seems like a lot of outlets haven't reviewed it yet yeah is it published by nintendo i guess published by nintendo yeah kyle are you playing this too I downloaded it and I, I I started it, but I I ended up switching over Resident Evil, so I don't have a lot to I don't have anything to say about the gameplay, unfortunately. But I'm excited to check it out and like the the sort of portal angle was exciting. And then like I was I was trying to look it up on the the eShop to see if they had the publishers and developers listed and stuff because I was curious about all those details, but I didn't really find anything. Yeah, Serial uh, checked it out yesterday, did a little research, and it's a developer who God, do you remember the name of them, Serial? Uh. Ooh. No. Okay. Uh, it, it was it was uh, Paladin Studio. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, Paladin Games or something like that. It was kind of confusing overall, but yeah, it seems cool. Jeff, do you like what you saw? I did. Uh, it seems very up my alley in terms of physicsy puzzle gameplay, but also just kind of being an ass and ruining stuff for other people, which is fun. Yeah, you just, I, just you can throw things around in these offices. You make like a big part of the game, at least early on, is like making slingshots out of uh, cords and cables, and so you can like mm-hmm. launch cactuses into people, and it's very silly. Yeah, I, I was wondering, does Nintendo ever publish indie games just when indie games don't have, or can can a, like an indie developer just put a game on eShop without having a publisher? I think they, they can, can self-publish. Yeah, yeah. I really that's, just that's want, how it's pursued. Yeah. I just want to come to a system that I actually own so that I can play it. Oh, I see. I'm, I see. I'm hopeful that it's not just Nintendo has exclusive rights to it. Right. Well, it's pretty you rare just, these days. But maybe they well, do. I would imagine it's coming. Yeah. Other 
platforms at some point. Well, I don't know. I mean, if they're publishing it, it's not like something like Snipper Clips, which they also published, was developed by that British studio. You know, like that never made its way off there and stuff. But yeah, yeah. I love like that weird genre of the sloppy physics driven puzzle game. Like I think mm-hmm. I was thinking about like even Cran Physics, which is an older game that I, I really love, but like there's some there's some magic in that. And especially this one, like being able to play co op. I'm really looking forward to, to diving in and playing with some folks here. Um so check that out everybody. Kyle, you also have been playing Filament. It's an interesting puzzle game where the whole premise is that the story is that like you're on a ship, you're and you're trying to land on a planet. It looks like maybe it's Earth. And what you have to do is you kind of have to dive into the sort of electronics of the ship to fix things or like to unlock doors. It seems like maybe there's an AI that's trying to slow you down. But the main gameplay is like you have these like I, the best way to describe it is like a rope that's a, like charged. So it's bright. It's glowing like electricity. And you have to like wrap the rope around pillars in a certain pattern in order to complete puzzles. And then it's just sort of like an iterative, you know, every puzzle is an iteration on that. And there's like different wrinkles and stuff like that. But like, I, I like that very, the, the, I, I always like the simple idea, like very immediately. It's like, Oh, I need to wrap ropes around these pillars to solve puzzles. And then it gets more and more interesting. So yeah. I've only played like the first hour, but I, th- I thought it was pretty cool. I liked, I liked the basic idea of it. Ha huh. filament on PC. That's cool. Yeah. Um, another thing we should touch on here, it happened last Thursday, so it feels like literally a lifetime ago, but um, Epic Games uh, got into publishing in a big way. And it's one of those stories where it's like, ah, oh, it's kind of businessy. How interesting is it? But I mean, it's it could be colossal. Like their overall pitch is Epic Games, like, hey, we're going to help fund games and give developers a bigger cut of the revenue than most publishers out there. Probably all developers out there, or publishers out there, because Tim Sweeney over at Epic is like, well, we are making the kind of deals now that we have all this Fortnite cash uh, that we wanted back when we were a developer. And they chose as the three uh, studios to help fund here uh, Remedy with their next project, multiple projects, uh, Gen Design, who's uh, Fumito Ueda from Shadow of the Colossus fame. So his next project, and then Play Dead, the developers of Inside, which is otherwise known as uh, Kyle's um, favorite studio in the world. Uh, that's right. I, I yeah. love those guys. It's, that guy? You got it. It is a juggernaut. Like, it, it's awesome, the choices that they made. I don't think they could have made three cooler indie studio choices than mm-hmm. these three to get out of the gate with. It's huge. Yeah. Good fix. Have, have they said uh, what in terms they're offering these these developers besides just money? Um, I mean, it's a lot. It's a 50-50 split, I think, right? Up After, to, they say. Up to, yeah. yeah. And then just, like, fully funding their projects. Also, like, also like, help. No questions mm, asked, yeah. No question. Please don't bug us. I mean, uh, honestly, because they, like, no, they're, they're not executing any creative control, so they're just like, you guys work mm-hmm. on the games, we'll pay for it, and then once we recoup our money, we'll, pro- we'll split the profits 50-50, you know? Yeah, but they also, let's like, say they're going to help with marketing and stuff like that, Jeff, so I guess they're going okay. the distance here. But, yeah, it's, it's awesome. You, like, want to go for super efficient teams, teams that can really turn this stuff out, and it's like, oh, man, if... If these terms are this relaxed, I'm curious, like, what if a waiter's like, yeah, maybe I kind of want to take my time and make something bigger, something on the scale of Last Guardian again. Like, not that it's going to go in development to hell, but I'm very curious how Epic deals with it when they eventually have a developer that's like, we can go bigger, we can go bigger. Like, I want to know what those limits are before Tim Sweeney has to go mm-hmm. knock on some doors and crack some heads over there. Um, but it's super exciting overall. Uh, and it had me thinking about like, yeah, what studios are out there? Which indie studios have been scrambling, hustling for a long time that would be awesome to have signed up with this deal. If it is as good as it seems from the outside and it's, hey, full creative control, you own the IP, we'll just help fund it and fund your employees here. Um, which studio comes to your your mind for who you want to be given a boatload of Fortnite cash to make their next game? Uh, let's see. We got Double Fine. We got <laughs> Undead Labs. Yeah, the big uh, indies. Let's Ninja get it. Theory. Obsidian. Mm-hmm. Insomniac, uh, mm-hmm. Nintendo. I mean, I, you joke. We we joke. That's a good joke, Jeff. Um, congratulations. Mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, comedy points since we just had David Sims <laughs> on the course. podcast. But um, I I actually one that I thought of, even though they are owned by Microsoft now, is a uh, Ninja Theory for me. Like I'm I'm sure that like they're they're well funded and and I I don't I can't imagine Microsoft's really like caging them at all. Yeah. But in terms of developers that I really love creatively, that always felt like they could never quite get to their full potential like ninja theory immediately comes to mind like right. I, I i would love for that like i love 
I would love for them to have gotten like the epic deal of like you guys do something you take as you know you get a lot of money you, you full creative control and then we'll just support you through that process you know which hopefully Microsoft is doing that for them but Epic yeah. just seems a little a little freer you know yeah I was thinking about still number one studio in my heart is you think about those studios that have been struggling just uh, being a little bit scrappy making projects happen where they can uh, is Harmonix like in terms mm. of like big indie studios I, that has to be coming up right I mean I'd imagine Alex Rogopoulos over there has at least interacted with Tim Sweeney at some point. So in terms of like the big studios that are indie left to fund for like a dream project, that has to be up there, right? So I'll yeah, say that'll yeah. happen within the next year. Uh, also just thinking about like the other ones that are still out there. It's like, oh, Behemoth, Cappy, uh, Moon Studio even, if you want to get nuts. Uh, they're not owned by Microsoft, the Ori That's and the, the Ori, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, another big one for me, they've only released one game, but it was a fantastic game, is Heart Machine. With Hyperlight Drifter? Oh, I could see that just for yeah. a cool project. Definitely. Um, they've, teased, uh, they've teased their next game. It's like looks like a 3D action game, but that's another one that just like I would love to see have a deal like that. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say, I think we already established that they're going to be bought by Microsoft, but Hello Games is another one. <laughs> I was thinking about that too, but then they kind of they have their own Fortnite money. Like you know, it's like a smaller team. No Man's Sky is selling so well that like they can kind of do what the hell they want. I'd imagine, yeah. but that would be that would be interesting for sure if they're mm-hmm. interested in making that partnership. Um, another one. This is this is pretty small, but the studio that made Republic or Republic, and they're making Iron Man VR. But Camouflage is still indie out there, and that'd be a fun one to to back up a bring trucks full of money back on. Anyways, uh, Epic Games publishing games. Uh, good for them. Super exciting. Uh, well, I was just gonna say Fulbright. I think would be a pretty oh, good candidate for that Oh, of course. I could see that and happening. Them not for having sure. to worry about like financial stuff. I think they could make something like like pretty ambitious. So yeah, this is the Gone Home team. Yeah, God, I haven't thought about that in a while for sure. What about um, Kojima? Like, what is he just? He's under Sony now, right? I mean, Five Hundred Five is publishing the PC version of Death Stranding, but like, what's next for that studio? That is a good question. Yeah, I wonder how interested sony is in continuing that relationship in a big way like i think it sold fine-ish didn't yeah. let the world on fire but that's another one I mean, too yeah it seems like epics i mean even their their trailer announcing it was very focused on like the sort of auteur angle right. of it all you know mm-hmm. like sam lake and remedy and fumito ueda with gen design and they even had Arndt jensen with play dead who's someone i as far as i can remember i've never actually seen him until watching that trailer that might yeah. not be true he might have appeared in other things and stuff but he's definitely like the as far as i know the creative force behind play dead games and then like kojima would be another fit there of like we got look who we got a person you know an auteur to make games for us you know and would also push that angle that handsome was talking about of when does tim sweeney have to start busting heads to get a game up <laughs> yeah Wait, you want to make seven commercials that play at the beginning of this game? <laughs> oh, hell, wait a minute. You want to use all the funds from Fortnite and just make one game? Well, I guess. All right. Can't say no. Um, Sergio Vasquez, do you know how this whole thing operates? Patreon. You got it, baby. <laughs> Patreon.com slash minmax 2 ends. Uh, you support us at any tier. You get access to our wonderful Discord, which is filled with a great community, including a bunch of Animal Crossing lovers. There's an Animal Crossing channel, and here's the sweet spot. I know none of you care so much, but uh, everybody's sharing turnip prices. The other day, somebody in there was like, yeah, turnips are going for 500 bells a pop, and I'll just open my gates. Here you go, which is just bankola it's amazing so anyways if you want access to that you can support us at any tier on patreon five dollar tier you get access to the audio versions of the deepest dives early access to the minmax show stuff like that also uh we got to have new stuff on that tv coming up here for the supporters in april um but um i am 8-bit is one of our biggest supporters and we'd like to thank them and we think you should check out their store because they're a really cool operation you should show them some love and support uh you check out the i am 8-bit store you can get the vinyl soundtrack for uh, Cuphead. It's a million different uh, soundtracks on vinyl. You can get the Inside Collector's Edition, just to go back to Play Dead. You can get the Lion King Legacy Collector's Edition cartridge, which is very cool. It's like a gold print. Uh, and for anything you buy in their store, you can use the promo code MINMAX, uh, and you get 10% off. And they want to point out that uh, they have the Ori and the Blind Forest soundtrack on vinyl and also the Ori and the Will of the Wisps soundtrack on vinyl. Even if you're not interested, if you like those games, you should look and see that artwork because it's amazing. It's artwork done by Aaron Vest here. Uh, and the stuff 
that they've done artistically for just producing that soundtrack is amazing. It would look great on a shelf. So please check them out and use promo code MINMAX for IM8 Bit. And you should definitely check them out because they're supporting our community in a big way by creating the I Am 8-Bit Question of the Week. So every week, people that write in to our podcast by leaving a comment on the Patreon post every single week, uh, we're going to choose our absolute favorite question, and then I Am 8-Bit will ship something out real nice. Um, I need to go get those items. Um, So, Jeff, in the meanwhile, you want to talk about what type of questions you're hoping to answer on the MinMax show this week? Uh, extremely personal and depressing questions are my favorite. Uh, mm-hmm. You guys? Off into a pool of sadness, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you go head first or toe first? Yeah, I, I, I like questions about what it's like to podcast from a kitchen. <laughs> good, good. Or a bedroom or a closet. Yeah. Or a basement. Whatever. Hey, prize this week. Look at this cereal. This is from I Am 8-Bit Store. This is an Owl Boy plushie. Ooh. So ooh. the winner of Question of the Week this week um, will get shipped out this wonderful Owl Boy plushie. And I'll leave it. Well, Owl Boy damned. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Justin Swart kicks things off by saying, hey, Activision recently announced the remaster of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and it released on March 31st, but only on PlayStation 4. This remaster of a 10-year-old game is not coming to Xbox or PC until April 30th. Why are we still dealing with timed exclusive deals in 2020? I guess I can understand some time content or... DLC, but full games? And a remaster on top of that? It's frustrating when companies like Microsoft and Nintendo are trying to knock down these arbitrary walls, but yet publishers like Activision pull this nonsense. Yeah, I understand that frustration. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, a, <laughs> well, it, it's still a business, right? And you have to come up with ways to make people want to buy your console a, over other consoles. It's not the it's not the Shangri-La that PC gaming is where it doesn't matter who you are or exclusives don't count for anything uh-huh. because everybody has a different PC and it doesn't really matter. So, I guess if if you're well of exclusive game, you know, first party games are running out, then this is an easy probably cheaper way to get people to buy your console or think that your console is better. And it's so weird for Sony to like pay for this exclusivity to be like, oh, maybe somebody will buy the PlayStation 4 at the tail end of its life. You know, it's just a weird time. And overall, the release of this Modern Warfare 2 remastered campaign thing is just bizarre. I feel like we're at about maybe peak hype for Warzone and just like enjoyment, maybe even player count for Warzone. So the idea of like putting out the single layer content right now, it seems so bizarre. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're doing. And it's especially weird now because, like, yeah, no one's going to necessarily buy a console for Modern Warfare 2 of all games. Yeah. <laughs> so what I guess what Sony's banking on is that they'll get enough of a cut from people buying it on PSN specifically for them to say, well, I was playing it on PlayStation, so, and that would help them. But it, a month, does it, it seems like long enough for people to wait, so it's especially oddly timed. Yeah, yeah or I, I wonder if it was just part of some other contract that they had with you know, Sony? Well, they did, yeah, because for, you know, uh, Modern Warfare, they had the the co-op missions were exclusive and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely, I mean, the the tie-in is deep with PlayStation and and Activision at this point. So we'll see. Um, Austin Nicholson says, Hey, Min Ben and the Max lads, I was thinking how most games base their maps off of New York or L.A. Do you think there could be more variety when it comes to locations in video games? Yeah. Sure could. Yeah. I mean, I always, I always joke that I want the next GTA to take place in my hometown. And what I'm, I kind of what I mean by that is, like, I think it would be fun for a GTA to take place in, like, not a metropolis. You know, just, mm-hmm. like, like a, a small town that, like, most people would have grown up in high school or something. Like, like the that. opening That's of GTA not, 5? I, honestly, yeah. Like, I think that would be fun, you know? And I, I think that could be a really cool setting, you know? But, yeah, yeah I don't know. The developers want to have their games exist in big metropolises. Well, I think things that people recognize and when you look at stuff, they're like, oh, I recognize that, you know. I also uh, feel like... Boxes in San Francisco and stuff. Yeah, but I feel like with GTA in particular and a lot of series out there, it's just less than like, oh, we're connected to these cities and it's more we love film so much and we're going to be pulling from film tropes for the story in this game with GTA in particular, right? And so like, yeah. we got to go for the big, most filmed cities. And that's all right. New York and LA are going to be up there for sure. But yeah, yeah. hopefully, 
they shake things up for GTA 6 wherever that could possibly take place. But yeah, there's a lot of like big metropolitan cities that haven't been covered. Even just like something like London, which you don't see as often, but you do. You like you see it sometimes. Tokyo, uh, yeah. things like I mean, uh, Sleeping Dogs took place in Hong Kong, which is which is pretty cool. Yeah. But, there are there are a ton of, of like really popular cities that people just don't do for whatever reason. Yeah, even like you know, Rio de Janeiro or something like that. Like it'd be fun to see something in that vein. Uh, twin cities. The twin yeah. cities. There's two of them. You, yeah. you could you could go to Min Max in the actual game. Yeah, Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes colon Twin Cities. <laughs> One for each snake. Mm-hmm. Twin City snakes. <laughs> That's the full title. One for each snake. <laughs> Zach Wojnar says, Hey, Ben and the Max Gateers, how many copies of Resident Evil 4 do you own slash have you played? I have a physical copy on PS2, a digital copy on PS3, a physical copy on PS4, but my brother took it with him to Ukraine this year, and who knows when the heck I'm going to get it back. I also just bought it this week on Switch because I got a Switch and I'm cool, right? So altogether, <laughs> that's four versions of Resident Evil 4. Can any of you beat that? Uh, in terms yeah. of ownership, no, because I turn around games very quickly. But in terms of platforms played, I, I've i played it on the GameCube. Uh, I've played it on the Wii, played it on Xbox, played it on PC, and played it on Switch. Wow. Yeah. There I you think, go. Yeah, I, I forgot about Wii, but yeah, I don't have them all any necessarily anymore. But yeah, uh, yeah um, GameCube PS2 I had for a little while. Wii xbox one and then switch so, and then the ios version that's no longer compatible and you can't get anymore oh yes i have played that one as well oh so damn it six jesus you guys that's amazing uh but congratulations that, zach you're also very good. embarrassing no i'm proud of you <laughs> kyle you tweeted like resident evil 4 is on sale on the switch this week everyone has to buy it here and i was like oh i, I am interested check it out it's like 20 bucks like that seems like it should have been the starting price for Resident Evil 4 yeah, on Switch. No, uh, you know? Yeah, it was down from 30 so yeah. you, can, you can, you know, meet your legal obligation to own Resident Evil 4 on mm-hmm. the latest platform. But yeah, it's it that is. And it's senseless. Those, are the, those are the two things you have to do this year. That's right. <laughs> uh, Knocking Nick says, Hello there, MinMaxers. Do you guys have a comfort game that relaxes you that would otherwise be a very tense experience for players? For me, Resident Evil Remake is nothing but pure bliss when I play it, even though it is meant to be a terrifying experience. To be clear, the first time I played the game, it scared the daylights out of me, but after after replaying it literally dozens of times, it is a calming and therapeutic treat. Uh, Serial, we were having a conversation when Hanson went to use the bathroom about how Animal Crossing stresses you out. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Which, which I think is funny because like I'm kind of in the same boat where I'm, I've started playing Animal Crossing, and like inventory management in that game I find stressful, like having to put things down to go sell things to make room in my pocket, and that. But playing Resident Evil 3 is, like, very relieving and not stressful at all, which is, like... Not stressful at all? Weird. No. No. Uh-uh. Especially after... The yeah. other joke I made off off recording was, after playing Half-Life Alex, like, nothing's scary anymore. <laughs> really? How's uh, how's Alex going, by the way? Uh, good. Soriel and I are actually in the same exact spot, and we're both very close to the end. Ooh, okay. There will be a max spoilers. Can we promise that? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. I think we can do that. Okay, that'd be super exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think of like, I think, you know, RTS games stress people out a lot, especially, you know, StarCraft, something a little bit faster, but like it's such a comfort food for me that it feels good to be in that zone or even something like a rhythm game, you know, like an amplitude where it's like, oh, there's, it's so fast. Everything's moving so fast. But it's like, that's just, I, my muscle memory is built up. So I feel happy in that zone, you know? Yeah, I think Dota is that way for me. Just because I, I know anyone coming into it now would, be extremely stressed out by all the different things you have to do but for me it's just like you just play a game and you basically forget about it and like it, it, that, that game actually like is so demanding that you kind of anything you're thinking about like oh, whether it's like a deadline or you know a stress from the outside world uh you basically have you have to put that aside because performing in that game is so like demanding of all your like different faculties and stuff that you yeah. basically you kind of it's so easy to just zone out and focus on nothing but Dota. For sure. Uh, Bob Buell says, Howdy fellas, looking like a million bucks. Look at that. Look at that, sweetie. Uh, where do you consider the line is for a game to be considered retro? I know that there's a line that is constantly shifting with every generation, but where would you draw the line in the sand for all games before it to be considered retro? I'd say going 3D. I think it's before playstation n64 right yeah super nintendo era i think you eventually officially retro (laughs) i 
I feel like the previous console generation is is retro enough. Like if you like what? imagine Fifty said Blood in the Sands. That's the, at this point, it's like a, a an old game. It's a retro movie. That's like, like calling Nirvana classic game. rock or something, though. That's just like that. Weird it thing is of, though. Like the the march of time, you can't stop it. Hanson, you're I getting think, old. I think it does. I, I'm not saying like oh, it can never be considered. I'm just saying calling something retro it needs to lock off at a certain era like classic rock you know what i mean like i'd say what are we talking 90s like the from 89 to 90 is that the cutoff for classic rock 86 so like no, i feel that, like i would say like lots of stations playing like stuff from the 2000s now on like their own like, i'm just saying if you constantly know. shift like that then all words are meaningless i think locking but, but it everything just gets point. shifted as like this is an older game like it's a retro game i don't i don't i don't necessarily see the the fact that there is a specific era if you had some like if you if you had some young you're punk being kid, absurd right now surreal well, yeah sorry, you're like, uh, the, the way that a lot of people like uh cordon that stuff off the stuff that you're kind of talking about is by like saying this is a, a, a fifth or sixth console generation game i think that's that's sort of what maybe you you two are like kind of mashing together it's like if if it's before like the sixth era it's like a retro game but like i think if anything, like I think Twitch's official thing of like if it's more than ten years old, it's like officially uh, something you can put in the retro category. I think is actually pretty fitting. We don't care that Twitch does it wrong, Serial. Yeah, <laughs> you can stick to your Twitch and your TikTok and all that stuff over there, Serial. We're going for the good archival history perspective. I feel like here. if it if it get if if with a few exceptions, if if it is getting a remaster, I think that it is a good candidate for it being a retro game. With That's some absurd. exceptions, like the the Last of Us was not a retro game when it got remastered. But if you're trying to remake that game and say, hey, we're going to add all these different features and stuff and kind of rework it so that it's a little bit more approachable. So Shadow of the Colossus, is, you're saying? Yeah, I would say that like from from the PS the PS4 Outrageous. remake of Shadow of the Colossus it is a remastering of a retro classic game. Out new rage new question. No Hanson, I can't I can't take this anymore. Hey, speaking of Bob Buell, sorry guys, you're gonna die one day and time passes. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so by the way, Bob Buell um, started a podcast in this quarantine time. I wanted to plug because he's a lovely member of the community called Ninety Nine Questions, and uh, I was the first guest on it. And it's basically rapid fire questions, which is very fun and flattering. So right. check that out nice. if you want to learn cool. way too much about everybody. Uh, Jeff Mullen says, with 2K bringing back Borderlands and Bioshock to the Switch, and XCOM 2, by the way, I wish it was Enemy Unknown, but still exciting, um, and Nintendo potentially releasing some Mario remakes, do you think Warner Brothers will bring the Arkham games to the Switch? Yes. Kyle yeah, says yes. Of course, too. The, the moment they announce whatever game they're working on, and imagine them saying, like, hey, you're getting whatever game, and also all your favorite Batman games are coming to... Well, just, I mean, Asylum, City, and Origins, right? I mean, I, not I don't Arkham think Knight is, can work. Yeah, what exactly. would they call that? What collection would they call that, though? Uh, well, yeah. I Before guess. the Night. Before the Night. There you go. You did it. Um, yeah. Well, they, they pretend Origins doesn't exist for some the Bat The Batman Late Afternoon collection. <laughs> Honestly, they could get away with just releasing Asylum on the Switch, and I feel like it would sell a gazillion oh. copies they don't need to kill themselves with the tech of First trying to game get... to ever sell a gazillion copies. <laughs> probably but honestly remember like kotaku was reporting that rumor that um or that they heard that warner brothers was going to have an e3 press conference that seems like the type of thing that would have been around announced at that time so i could see them still announcing it in that window at some time but yeah. do you uh, see um bethesda today pete hines tweeted that they won't be doing anything in june in terms of like oh really conference or anything like that which is like maybe the first domino to fall in terms of like you know because we all kind of assumed oh that that window in june will still be a big announcement period but we know now that at least bethesda is stepping away from that window so yeah, yeah. but i'm sure they're happy with that don't you think like after yeah. after last year's conf like they don't have anything more of elder scrolls 6 and starfield to tease at this yeah. point right yeah and like maybe maybe screen. they weren't going to have anything even if e3 was going on still, yeah. saying, right? Yeah, yeah I'd like, I personally would like to see something for the next uh, Wolfenstein game, but I don't think that game's coming out this year, so maybe they just shorten the the cycle on that. So instead of there being a trailer where it's like, well, it's E3, you gotta have a trailer out by then, they can say, well, we can just spread the the marketing campaigns for our different franchises apart, you know, and yeah. I'm sure that alleviates a lot of the stress on PR people. Jeff, um, your posture is so good. Sometimes it looks like you're like um, in a, like you've been kidnapped and you're like, 
being held prisoner in your kitchen because you're just like so it looks like you're like squirming every once in a while can you show us Sorry. your hands are they this, bound this this chair is uncomfortable yeah, oh great uh derek maldana maldana do thank you derek uh, it says hello everybody Hi. Hello. Thank you. Uh, with the final days of the PS4 upon us and the release of Persona 5 Royale. Royal? Um, Royal. Current, out this week, by the way. Uh, currently, the three highest rated PlayStation exclusive and Metacritic are The Last of Us Remastered, Persona 5 Royale. Royal? Royal. Royal. Okay. And God There's of War. No My question is, uh, do you think any of the upcoming PlayStation exclusives have a chance of matching or topping those three before the PlayStation 5 releases? No. The Last of Us 2, potentially. Right? Yeah. I don't think it's topping those. Yeah. I will say 0% chance. All right. 0%. 0%. Well, okay. Let's go with a 1% Ghost of chance. I think Ghost of Tsushima is going to be good, and I think it's going to be a solid 88 on Metacritic. Yeah. Yep. Somewhere in that <laughs> realm. Okay. Uh, I can see The Last of Us Part 2 doing it. Yeah, I can see The Last of Us Part 2 doing it. Really? Topping that? Potential. What are the. What I mean, it's not going to. I don't know that it'll top all of them. I could see it being among the top. Uh, Last of Us Remastered on PS4, Jeffum, is, as everybody knows, 95 on Metacritic. That seems like a high bar to clear for a sequel. Like I said, I, I think it'll get it in... It'll breach that top three. Okay. Hugo A says, hey, CLCs, what's one video game mechanic you can live without? For me, is it's the... For me is, oh boy, for me it's the ranking system in stylish action games. I'm not the best at pulling off combos, so seeing a grade at the end of a level takes some enjoyment away from me. Looking at you, stone ranking and Bayonetta. Anyway, thanks for all the hard work. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I'm with him. I, I, I'm terrible at those games, and it's always demoralizing to see that grade. I hate that too, and, and Resident Evil has that in a bunch of achievements of like, you beat it in S ranking under an hour and it's like i don't want to do any of this don't don't have me play through this entire game and save the world and then give me a d <laughs> you know I, I i don't know that uh crafting has ever been like something yeah. i've been really excited about that's my answer it's always, i think it's what? it's easily it's the worst part of god of war yeah i think it's, it's very just, fun it feels like it feels like you're rooting through menus a little bit and yeah. when it's put it, in action games it's like i kind of want to get back to yeah i'd rather just like you stuff. just give me the upgrades as normal and not have to for me to combine you know have to go through a whole material system well what to, about the mac daddy kyle what about minecraft isn't that kind of fun isn't that fun i'd game? rather just i'd if rather the, core just, like, the game you know, is building your own things out of other things i think that's fine but it like in something like God of War, for example, I thought it was completely unnecessary. Yeah, it's and to be clear, like I don't hate it. I just like if it was never in stuff again, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't miss I, it. I wouldn't be heartbroken. All um, right, uh, that's crater. Absurd. Uh, no, hold oh, on, oh, oh, Hanson. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Mine is having to hold it in a button instead of just pressing it. But it makes it so you make fewer mistakes. No, it doesn't. Oh, yeah, it, it does. It's just I annoying. On that. It is just annoying to have to hold in every button like I'm stuck in the mud when I'm going through an inventory. I'm annoyed when it's inconsistent. If it's, if it's important, if it's an important decision, then give me an extra screen that says, "Hey, idiot, are you sure you want to do that?" Uh huh. See, I'd rather have the. I I don't want another menu to pop up. I just mm -hmm. like I'd rather. You don't want to have to press a button twice. You'd rather have to hold in a button for a second every time you're doing stuff in a menu. This is why you don't like crafting, Kyle. Yeah, I mean, no, honestly, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of with you, Jeff. I, I like Thank the, you. I like fast menus. There we go. Fast uh, menu. <laughs> Crater says, Ahoy, <laughs> Captain Hansen and the quarantine-loving crew. With University of Minnesota fully online now, I've been having to find some ways of breaking up my studying and lectures and have opted for keeping my PlayStation Vita or Switch by my desk and breaking my study time up with 10 to 15 minute cracks at a game to make it less monotonous and give my brain a break. My question is, what games would you recommend that are good for these short intervals of entertainment digestion? My go-to games lately for this purpose have been Super Metroid on my DS, Super Meat Boy and Animal Crossing on Switch, and Castlevania Symphony of the Night on Vita. What would you folks be playing? P.S. Going to the University of Minnesota for mechanical engineering, in case you were curious. Been a mechanic for the past dec decade, and after spending a large portion of the time complaining about engineers, I figured it was time to put up or shut up. I know that department <laughs> nice. well. I streamed classes uh, there for three years. Anyways. Yeah. Um, While watching Incredibles and waiting for Guffman on your phone. Is that right? Kyle, you pay attention to me in my uh -huh. life. I do. That's You're amazing. a very fascinating and strange person. <laughs> Thank you. Anyways, um, what games would you recommend that are good for short intervals of entertainment? Um, it's 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 very 
you know, to my taste, but any Picross game, I feel like it's perfect for playing for five to ten minutes. Like yeah. I, I, I beat PictoQuest recently, and I miss it, because I liked having that game that I could just solve a puzzle and put down, you know? Yeah, there's a, the obvious one, which is Animal Crossing. If you're not being a maniac like so many people out there are, um, the second installment of The Deepest Dive is now live, by the way, for everybody on YouTube or in the Patreon exclusive uh, podcast feed. But um, <laughs> it's like it's a good 20 minutes a day. You know, it's just it's just sweet if you want to just have a good time with that game, and that's that's got to be the go-to here. Yeah, uh, Slay the Spire was the other one I was going to call out. It might be a little more than 10 or 15 minutes for a run, but around there. Yeah, I didn't know you played that game. Yeah, they have it on Xbox Game Pass, and I played a bunch. Yeah, nice. Good stuff. Good stuff. Sincerely, Eric says, hey, Ben and the Quarantinis. Deenie. Uh, where's the first place you're going when this is all done? Serial's bedroom, probably. I'm going to hide under his bed. Hanson's basement again. Yeah. That's probably the answer. It might honestly be that. Honestly, like with, <gasps> what a I, thrill. I so. Maybe a restaurant or something. But, Ooh, how exotic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Eric says, on the topic of visiting studios, what is something you've seen that stands out to you? Something from video game history that they have at a studio that's cool? Something like a Frappuccino maker? I assume something from video game history would be cooler, but does anything stand out for y'all? Um, going to see uh, Quantum Break. Yes. For Remedy, they had a closet, and in that closet, it was a big closet. It was a big room. Let's call it a big room. They had shelves of stuff, and one of the things they had was like the I don't know what it was called exactly, but it was a PC that housed like the mastered final code for Max Payne. Yes, and we actually like, have. They kept, they kept that PC. Which is amazing, just in case they need to go back to the source code and make sure that it can still run on something, which is such a fun idea. We actually have a video uh, on Game Informer's YouTube channel. Jump over to our sister site, Game Informer, and check that out. <laughs> but it's going through all those archives of all the stuff that Remedy's kept throughout the years. And that was a really cool one, just the idea of like, well, we know Max Payne runs on this. Here's all the data. Let's just keep this forever now. And it's such a fun thing. I also wrote that one down, Kyle, because I was, I was oh, excited yeah, about that one. That's a good one. Yeah. Or like uh, another trip we went on together, thinking about... The um, we went to Crystal Dynamics for Rise of the Tomb Raider, and they said that they had the raw recordings of Dana Gould recording the voice of Gex, and and the, like the guy's like, oh, I just saw it actually. It's in like our archive room. I was like, what? Like you gotta help share that. Like let's get some outtakes from Gex, and they never sent it our way, but that's still very <laughs> compelling. Uh, uh, or I love that um, Bethesda has a computer that still runs Elder Scrolls One there, which is fun. So like during wow. our tour there. I filmed, and he didn't want to do it, but I filmed uh, Todd Howard like <laughs> booting it up, and then the screen, uh, or then the computer blue screened, uh, and I included that in the video, and they were not too pleased about that. But it's like, who cares? Like, it's just like a funny, silly thing that happened. It's not like, wait, those games are buggy. Elder Scrolls One won't play. Um, or like, I think it was, um, oh God, it's a little vague, but I think Naughty Dog, they have like uh, early letters. Um, like business contracts and stuff from like the genesis of Naughty Dog, which is cool, framed on their wall. And then they also have, I believe what it is, it's like the, the early sketchings of like the design flow for Crash Bandicoot's moves. So like literally like if you press this, Crash does this. And it's just like this crude drawing that I think Andy Gavin made and stuff that's framed on their walls, which is sweet. That's cool. Yeah. I like that at NetherRealm they have a bunch of like their old history stuff, like all the... The, the Goro mannequin that they sent over to the film studio for the movie. Yeah. Like that stuff's really cool. They have like an arcade with all their like classic card game, arcade games and like the grid on there as well. Yeah. Or the um, member at From Software in the entryway in the lobby, they had like that weird sculpture that Famitsu made back in the day. What are their old, what are those old PlayStation games that people love? Kingsfield? Yeah. Like old Kingsfield yeah. designs that are really cool where it's like birds and stuff in there. It's very bizarre. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Enright says, good morning, Minnesota. And hello, my nemesis, Jeff, um, spelled with a J. He spelled it. Oh, he's a geoff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, some friends and I are going to have a virtual game night, but not all are gamer hobbyists. We're looking for easily accessible, lower complexity games to play. Think virtual form of Cards Against Humanity or something completely different. The only game I have at the moment is Evil Apples, a free phone app car, a phone app like Cards Against Humanity. Anything else you know about that you'd recommend? Well, uh, Jeff, the obvious answer is Jackbox. Um, yep. And 
Uh, it's relatively easy to play during this time, even remotely, because if you're just over Discord or something, you can screen share, and that'll be the master screen that everybody just uses their phone and the browser in their phone. I've actually had a lot of people tweet at me, at least two, um, in the last couple of weeks, like asking for recommendations on which Jackbox games to get to help get through the quarantine and stuff. And so I've made my official ranking of the Jackbox Party Packs, if you all are ready. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. I almost texted you for this, so I'm excited about it. Oh, this. really? Okay, here we go. Yeah, oh, by the way, real quick, before you start, I believe all the games are on sale on Jackbox's website. Yes, it is absurd. Like you buy them through their website, they're on sale, so before you start. Including, like, Drawful 2 was on sale on the Switch for literally six cents. And I, Yeah, I think it's free most other places right now. Yes, yeah. it is amazing. So, uh, so, Party Packs here. Party Pack 3 is number one. Party Pack 1 is number two. Party Pack 2 is number three. <laughs> I'll stop with the numbers. That's confusing. So from the best to worst, Jackbox Party, Jackbox Party Pack 3, 1, 2, 6, 5, 4 is my ranking. So 3 is the best because Quiplash, I think, is the most fun game that they've made. Just the easiest thing of here's a prompt, you enter a joke, and then people vote which joke they like better, whichever answer they like better. That also contains TKO, where you're designing t-shirts, so a fusion of writing jokes and drawing t-shirts. It's hilarious. Also, Trivia Murder Party is a fun presentation and an overall good trivia game. The people forget about it, but forget about it. But Jackbox Party Pack One is also surprisingly solid. That one has you don't know Jack Fibbage Excel, which is another trivia game where you're trying to trick people thinking that your incorrect answer is actually the right one. And Drawful, which is super fun. Um, so I'd recommend those. But in terms of like the standalone stuff, Drawful Two I think is great. Obviously, if it's free or on an insanely uh, discounted rate, definitely check that out. But Quiplash is the best standalone game and you can buy that standalone so honestly if you're looking for like a reasonable experience here get jackbox party pack three and get drawful two standalone that is gonna be your best one two punch a lot of fun packed in there oh also here's my ranking of the best individual games in jackbox that is basically irrelevant because they're all bundled in with other stuff so it's confusing but i think (laughs) the best uh jackbox games individually are quiplash 2 drawful 2 tko Push the button, Fibbage 2, patently stupid. That's that's my top tier. Jeff, you can uh, My cur- recommendation is to oh, yeah. break out a Wii, track down WarioWare, play it, and unlock the multiplayer, which is going to take more time than you want it to. Uh-huh. And then that's a great game to play with uh, people who aren't big gamers. Uh, but remember that whole that thing doable, right? <laughs> where uh, people can't go to each other's houses, Cal? Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but great suggestion other than that. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Fabled Ursa says, hey, with the recent events going on in the world around us, there have been a lot of buzzwords going around, like the word quarantine. With Rainbow Six Quarantine set to release later this year, could you see this name negatively impacting sales? Or might Ubisoft even consider changing the name of the game altogether? I don't, I don't think it would hurt it. I, don't think I could see really them delaying it, it, but I don't think they're going to change the name. Would they delay it just for development reasons because developers are out of the studio or you think like they just think it's going to be insensitive to release a game yeah, called Quarantine? Yeah, I would say that they would wait for that reason but I don't think they changed the name. Okay. Uh, Ethan Horn, quick question. By the way, you staying awake over there, Serial? Yeah. Okay. You seem... Hey man, you seem kind of out of he, your mind. I don't think going to speak up but he told us earlier he's not feeling very well so he's really a trooper right now. Oh, Serial, thank, thank you. Yeah, so don't mock Serial. I'm not. I'm asking you if he's okay. <laughs> Ethan Horn says, quick question. What is the food etiquette while using a video chat service like Zoom? Does it change depending on the meeting? Can I hold my Switch under the camera and play Animal Crossing? What are the rules? Don't. What is the what etiquette? I think the rule is don't use Zoom because it like steals your data. But <laughs> well, there is something <laughs> fishy about that. Do you know more about that story about what the controversy is, Serial? No, I, I, I just heard that it collects a lot of data and like there are ways for like your boss to keep tabs on you. So if you're like all tabbing or whatever, looking at other tabs, it, it can alert like the, the people in the call, which is kind of like a really not cool thing to do. But I don't know. There's just a lot of privacy stuff involved with the Zoom that I, that that I've read. But gotcha. Yeah. Um, uh, he's asking about if you can. Yeah, he's asking about food etiquette, Jeff. Um, I think don't eat food if you're on a video yeah. conference call. If it's yeah. like lunchtime and you're you can at least mute your mic whenever you're eating. I think it's okay, but otherwise it's like, yeah, if, if you don't need to eat at that moment, I think you can probably put it off. 
Yeah. And uh, just give them your undivided attention. Because I don't like that idea of like, what is that person doing in the video call? Like, I can't mm-hmm. see their hands. Are they playing Animal Crossing? What is happening over there? So just... Are they staring back? Because I want to play Animal Crossing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, what was that? Exactly. <laughs> uh, Tim Laro says, uh, do you feel any pressure while under isolation to make the best of your time, most of your time? I feel like I've been fortunate so far, but there's been a nagging voice in my head that I should be using this time to exercise more, call my parents, read more books, learn a language... Should I give myself a break? I'm still working from home. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I have definitely felt that myself. Uh, Like, you know, I should be not just trying to de-stress, but also learning a new hobby or something. Yeah. I, I think this is, it's such a weird time that I think this is probably cluing people into you should be kind of making these personal life choices and prioritizing things differently this is just kind of giving people an a window into that and so you don't have to go all nuts just because you're home for two weeks but maybe that's something to think more about for the rest of your life once this is over you you know, basically anytime that you have like a free evening or an afternoon you could be devoting that to doing something other than just you know being on social media or re-watching a show you know yeah absolutely and we talked about it you know a couple episodes ago just about ways to get through the quarantine and hopefully improve yourself and we're still you know we'd love for people to write in about how what they are doing specifically to make themselves better during this time because yes it's very yeah. easy just to watch shows and uh, go into your spiral of depression um Speaking of which, it's Major Panda says, I've been having an absolute blast with the community in the last week or so, mainly through the Discord uh, for MinMax, but I'm a little perturbed. How much interaction is too much interaction, and am I being annoying? But that's not my question for you. Uh, by the way, no, I think you're doing fine. Uh, the Discord is a place to talk. So, um, He says, but that's not my question for you. When is the last time you have had self-loathing thoughts like these, and what do you think is the correct response? Oh, I mean, I I have those often about social interactions, like, and like I've even gone so far as to like I'll message people after some kind of interaction and be like, hey, sorry if I was being weird there, and like it's been unnecessary a hundred percent of the time. So yes, I do over I do overthink past social interactions a lot for sure. Because it turns out, I mean, it's a little bit like it happens a lot uh, when recording stuff. Where it's like, oh man, I was in a daze. I was out of it. I was distracted i didn't know what i was talking about and then i go back and listen to the recording and it's like oh i sound exactly the same or pretty yeah. normal and i think that's the way it works for like those interactions because i've had that too of like just reaching out to somebody like i thought you were fine i didn't notice anything no one pays as much attention to you as you do you know yeah i mean no one thinks we... as negatively about you as you do as well you know yeah. that's that's just a symptom of being in your own head and not being able to control what you you know how much you're analyzing what you're doing the the other people that you're interacting with that you're worried about they're doing that to themselves not to you yeah, yes more focus on themselves and especially like with like strangers also if even if it was like egregiously bad you'll probably never see that person again <laughs> <laughs> hey as uh they said in the pete holmes podcast at some point 100 years new people too so hey it's all fleeting it doesn't matter here just move, right. keep actually, moving that along. is comforting actually. yeah <laughs> like uh roberto zayas says any stories of legendary culinary creativity good or bad during this pandemic it could also be something you did during the did before the pandemic when i was in elementary school a hurricane hit puerto rico and i spent almost a whole month drinking a mix of two-thirds welch grape juice one-third coca-cola with a side of saltine crackers delicious <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you i've actually i mean i my wife and i we've been trying to cook a lot more like it's not like scary weird stuff but like we we ordered a uh, like a standing mixer because it was on sale and we she baked bread and it was fantastic and we made homemade spaghetti yesterday which was crazy how do you do that uh so you we have the standing mixer and then you can buy this attachment that goes on the front of it that's basically like these two rolling pins and you basically make dough and then you squeeze the dough through the rolling pins and then you make then you change the setting to make the rolling pins get smaller and smaller and smaller and you keep flattening and flattening and flattening the dough and then you run it through a separate attachment that like cuts it into strips and then you have a homemade spaghetti i'll be damned Uh, it it was pretty good Nice. Although I overcooked it because uh, you don't have to boil homemade spaghetti as long, so it was like a little, it was a little too soft. But um, I'm sorry. yeah, so that's the kind of stuff we've been getting into. I mean, it's mostly Ashley, my wife, who's been pushing that and like trying to try different things. And I, I love it. I like I like 
experimenting in the kitchen. I think it's fun. Yeah, sweet. Jeff, I'm using like a real chef over there. That's right. I've been perfecting a morning sandwich over the past week. Morning sandwich. Or two weeks. Yeah. Well, I don't eat it every day because it's probably not super healthy, but toasted wait, wait. bread. You don't eat the sandwich every day, right? Yes. Is that what you mean? Because you said yeah, I no, don't I don't I don't eat it all, you know. Okay. Only like every third day because that's not healthy. Right. Jimmy Kimmel approach. Yep. Uh, but toasted bread, uh, two eggs cooked. I don't know what it's called. Sunny side up, just fried eggs. And then cheddar cheese on top of that, which you heat in the pan with the eggs once the eggs are mostly cooked. And then a slice of honey baked ham on that. And then you get kind of a spring mix of lettuce that you put on top of it, mm. plus a little bit of Tabasco. And you put it all in the sandwich. And then once you pick up the sandwich, you can't put it back down because the egg yolks are going to break yeah. and they're going to ooze everywhere. Yeah. But very good. Very tasty. Actually, you're in your kitchen. Why don't you whip one up right now and rub it against the camera for everybody? I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Great. Uh, Jeff, have you seen the movie Birds of Prey? Have you seen that? The Harley Quinn movie? No. There's, Why would there's I a, do that to myself? Because it's good. I liked it. It's a funny movie. Um, but there's a whole, there's a, there's a very crucial sequence about making a breakfast sandwich that Harley Quinn describes in detail. You there you go. Crucial. Uh, Brandon, <laughs> I mean, it is. <laughs> you can watch the movie. Brandon Sylvia uh, from Easy Going Gaming says, what game or series of games do you think has the most untapped potential currently? For example, I was just thinking about Alpha Protocol for the first time, and throughout my entire playthrough, I kept thinking, dang, if this game had this feature or this feature, it could have been an all-time great. So what game series has the most untapped potential? Alpha Protocol is a great answer to that. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen more of those. I would still say I'm still hung up on uh, Stay Decay. Yes, yes. I want a Stay to Decay that actually works and is, you know, as am. The next level of ambition, because I think that series has always been super ambitious with what it was trying to do, and it kind of came out janky, and then they didn't fix anything for the sequel somehow. Yes. But they're, they're sitting within Microsoft that has to have billions of dollars behind them, you know? And in Not terms of like giving it to the Undead Labs team, but... No, I, I'm with you 100%. And now that, like, okay, State of Decay 2 was developed without Microsoft owning them, so hopefully now that they're inside the house, like... Having a zombie franchise to pour a lot of money in, I know Microsoft also tried that with Dead Rising for a while, but that's beside the point. But like having a zombie mm-hmm. franchise to pour a lot of money in is always a pretty safe bet, right? And like when you have yeah. State of Decay, I hope that for State of Decay 3, they do go for more of that MMO persistent world thing that they've been talking about since the first game. Yeah, more more multiplayer. The simi aspect, you know, the simulation aspect of it is so interesting. The permadeath thing, I feel like with the renaissance of like hard games and games that have, you know, like permanent uh, outcomes based on what you've done or what you haven't done and like punishing games like that, that could just be so interesting. And they just haven't, they haven't nailed it the first two times. So. Yeah, absolutely. Tommy. Uh, For for me, uh, Gravity Rush, I think is like a a series of some untapped potential because I think the the core mechanic of floating around is so strong. Uh, I think the only thing that's held those games back is I, I think the design of like the missions and stuff they build around that has usually been pretty bad. Yeah. So, like you have this really incredible mechanic that they just don't use as well as I think they should. Ugh, yeah. So That's a like tough a sequel, one. Like that kind of felt that didn't feel like super bound to like, well, we have to have a stealth mission. We have to have like platforming and racing challenges and just kind of lean more into what makes that series fun, I think would be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Tommy White says, hey, did you all see the April Fool's joke on Opa Critic that mentions Kyle? Here's the link. <laughs> did you see this, Kyle? Yeah. It, someone, I think Adam Walker uh, tweeted it at me, and I didn't I didn't understand what was happening. It's super weird. I, the, so it's a joke post on Open Critic about how they're going to change the values of, like, they, they're going to give, you know, like, IGN reviews more weight than, you know, other reviews. But, the, and it's, it's, it's just all over the top and silly, but the thing that's weird about it is, like, in the intro, they just randomly call out two reviewers, and one of them is me. <laughs> like, I don't, it's just, I think they just picked two random names, and one just happened to be me. And I think they also chose me because, like, to make an IGN joke. Which is oh. funny, because, like, I really do not, uh, you know, think of myself as, like, a representative of IGN at, in any way. <laughs> right, right. But, yeah, that was very weird. I was very confused by that. It's very odd. Edgar Vasquez, friend of the show, 
Oh, friend oh. of Surreal. Brother yeah, right. of Surreal. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hey seriously, Surreal, with Edgar, friend first, brother second, or vice versa? Uh, that's such a weird because like brother includes friend in a lot of ways. So I don't mm, know. No, I, not in this question. I don't, re- I don't really know how to make that split. Mm, yeah. So I don't know. Um, so Tommy <laughs> White. <poetry. laughs> okay, so sorry. Edgar Vasquez says, "Hey, what's the earliest you were sure of your game of the year and were right?" Uh, I mean, it might be this year with Kentucky Red Zero, but I think oh my before God. then, uh, probably Breath of the Wild in 2017. Yeah, I, I, March, right? So yeah, so that was a yeah. That I after playing that game, I was like, well, everything else is gonna have to do a much better job if it's gonna be from this. And, and food nothing. doesn't taste as good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. I I tried to make an egg sandwich, and it's just I was like, I'd rather go explore than eat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Daniel answer, White says, "Hey, we're listening to old Game Informer podcast because I'm bored to tears. Um, I found a clip of clip of Kim making fun of Fortnite before it blew up, and it's pretty funny. Uh, I went back and checked this out. This is like it was me defending Metal Gear Survive and how like I like that style of game, and then I compared it to Fortnite. This is before Fortnite launched, and Kim's like, what happened to that game? And then everybody gets a good laugh out of like, what a disaster. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so he says, I'm wondering, what's the most wrong first impression you've ever had about a game or show or band or franchise or anything? People? <laughs> I thought, what was the uh, Cliff Blazinski Battle Royale? Radical Heights. I thought that game was going to be a hit. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I... I I wasn't like super confident, but I was I was surprised when it collapsed, you know, because I thought it was doing some fun things within the sort of uh, battle royale world. And '80s stuff is so hot right now, but I guess not hot enough. <laughs> not hot so. enough, yeah. Collapsed and brought the studio down with it. Yeah, I mean, I've talked about it before, but like on the God of War cover story trip, I was like, ooh, I don't think that game's gonna turn out great. Uh, and then it turns really? out to be my favorite game of the year. Yeah, I thought it was like this is gonna be a solid eight. It just it was in a rough spot when we saw it and I was like a lot of these things I don't know how they're going to fix but they did it they they crunched their way through it so hey hats off to them um, Michael Moran says what is one thing you wish was more socially acceptable running places is my answer all through college <laughs> I remember wanting to run everywhere around campus without looking like a dork just for efficiency's sake also picking your nose should be acceptable as long as you wash your hands afterwards we all do it Michael you're wrong on the second one you're out of line but the running thing I was literally just thinking about yesterday, Michael, because I was looking out my window and saw somebody running down the street, and I was like, that, it really freaks me out. Like, in this time of quarantine, to see somebody not only outside, but sprinting outside, and at, they're just exercising, but I was like, oh, God. But I was thinking, like, it would be nice. Like, I don't really run, but if it was just more socially acceptable, they're like, oh, I'm going to go visit my neighbor, I'll just run there. Like, it seems like it should be more socially, socially acceptable, and I, I feel like I would freak other people out if I was running. <laughs> yeah, you just you have you have to just wear exercise clothes is the oh, answer. Oh, okay. That, that's that's like your key to being able to run in an acceptable way. Well, what's the fewest amount of exercise clothes that I can just put on? Can I put on just like a sweatband and then run and nobody will question it? <laughs> probably. Okay. Uh, probably all right. Do it. I'll take it. I think if you're not, as long as you're not wearing like jeans or slacks, I think any that and a headband, I think will probably let people know that you're. You're not being chased by a zombie or whatever. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, or, or just get a shirt that says "I'm running for exercise" on it. But I run so fast that no one will be able to see that because I'm I'm oh. like a jackrabbit out there. Well, on the front it says "Don't worry," and on oh. the back it says "No zombies." Yeah. <laughs> Smart. Uh, Hans Glennenberg says, "What do you make of the rumor uh, of Microsoft?" Oh, Microsoft buying most of, if not all, of Konami's IP: Silent Hills, Metal Gear, Castlevania, all that stuff. This has been bubbling for so long. Kyle, you you have your daily gaming podcast. Yeah. What's going on here? I haven't heard Microsoft. That's the first I've heard that. I've heard, I've Sony. heard Sony. Yes. Yeah. Maybe Hans is, is confused. Okay. But anyway, like the question still stands is like the rumor is that Sony wants to sort of buy Silent Hill and maybe even have Kojima Productions pick Silent Hills back up is the rumor. Yeah. And that like some of the folks who were involved in the original Silent Hill are bringing it back. I mean... I think Silent Hill is due for a return. I don't think Kojima is going to be involved in Silent Hills in any way. Like, and Konami had a statement. Make, yeah, Konami had the statement. That? Konami had the statement about it, saying like, "Hey, uh, the rumors yeah. out there are false. Like, it's not a dead franchise, but it's not happening the way 
the internet thinks it is, which is, oh, yeah. maybe Kojima is going to develop the next Silent Hills game or Silent Hill. Yeah, game. I don't. I, I think I think Kojima is probably like he can if he. He can do his own IP now. Like he's he's good. You know, I don't think he yeah. wants to be tied to like if he wants to make a scary game, he'll just make a scary game. But I think Silent Hills is due for or Silent Hill singular is due for a return. I'd like to see a new Silent Hill. I bet that will happen within the next three or four years. Yeah. I yeah. Please I could someone just buy that, that from Konami. Yeah. Get all or, that old yeah, Konami like, IP. Or co- if Sony wants to co-fund it and like make it an exclusive, I could see that happening. Like that, I yeah, that, like a PS5 game, a new Silent Hill. Yeah, maybe a remake of Silent Hill Two or something. That's what I'd like to see happen. Definitely, uh, Scott Castro. This is this is a whopper. He says, "I've got a game for you, mm. based on your collective ex- appreciation for both video games and The Simpsons. I give to you DLC slash expansion pass title or Simpsons episode name." <laughs> Oh, the game is simple. I'll provide a title. You tell me if it's the title of a DLC or expansion content, such as The City That Never Sleeps from Insomniac Spider-Man or Black Arrow, the expansion of Rainbow Six Three, or the title of a Simpsons episode. All right. Okay. Jeff, mark your phone. Going, going around the horn? Yeah. Old Money. I'm going to say that's DLC. This is a Simpsons episode. In the episode, Grandpa says Simpson meets an old woman at the retirement castle who passes away and leaves him $106,000. Not to be confused with Dead Money, which was the DLC for Fallout New Vegas. (laughs) Pretty tricky out of the gate here, Scott. All right, Kyle. Hmm? uh, Island Thunder. I think that's DLC. You know, Far Cry or something like that. Ooh, very close. DLC pack for the original Ghost Recon. Oh, okay. Serial Vasquez. Bonfire of the Vanities. Uh, Simpsons episode? I'm sorry. The Simpsons episode is Bonfire of the Manatees. Bonfire mm-hmm. of the Vanities <laughs> is DLC for Assassin's Creed 2. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Um, mm-hmm. Whacking Day. Whacking day. Oh, that's Simpsons. Damn it. Okay, yeah. That's the weasel say, episode, right? Uh the snakes. 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 Right, right. Snake did. Uh all right, Kyle. <laughs> Guns, love, and tentacles. DLC. DLC for Borderlands 3, which just came out. Yes. Yeah. Uh Serial. Mountain of Madness. DLC? Incorrect. Oh, hang on. There is apparently a DLC pack of the roguelike game Eldritch called Mountains of Madness. Similar, but different. Okay, you're pushing it, buddy. But uh, it's a Simpsons <laughs> episode. Mr. Burns forces the workers of the nuclear power plant to go for a team-building hike in the mountains. Okay. Jeff, um, the trouble with trillions. Simpsons episode? Correct. The episode seems sees Homer being sent by uh, the FBI to try to obtain a trillion dollar bill that Mr. Burns failed to deliver to Europe. These must be later. I don't know this one. All right, yeah. Kyle, last one. The Path Home. Simpsons. Incorrect. DLC ah. for Shadow of the Tomb Raider. But hey, good game, Scott. Good game. Good game. Uh, what do you guys like for question of the week? Uh, I liked the the wrong first impression. I liked that one. That one was good. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. Okay. Hey, they I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe our, we didn't have a lot of great answers for it, but I liked I liked the premise of the question. Yeah. Um, I like the um. I like the where's the line for retro. Jeff, I'm got really yeah. angry about that one. That's just because Serial's so absurd about that. <laughs> yeah. I think you guys true. are you guys are just trying to deny your mortalities is all okay <laughs> uh i like the something obscure from studios but we've had a couple studio ones in a row i don't know if that matters yeah um the pressure to make the most out of your isolation game series that haven't reached their potential oh i you know what i liked i liked that one too i thought you were gonna say pokemon for that one hansen i had that written down but i'm like the pokemon mo has been talked about to death everybody gets their <laughs> idea uh what do you guys like somebody make a call please Uh, let's go retro one all right retro that is bob buell congratulations bob buell thank you very much well done uh again you can submit a question by supporting us on patreon at any tier and then you have a chance of being shipped out something very nice it's a random thing every week and this week it's a good old owl boy plushie so enjoy that bob uh for now i think it's time for get a load of this who's starting is it me again 
Let's go for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So there's a not not to get too topical, but uh, oh, there boy. is a an account called Coronabot that randomly says this character tests positive for COVID nineteen. Uh, oh, but it gets trust me. This this goes to a place you might not be expecting. So one of their posts just said, uh, "Breaking news: Donkey Kong tests positive for COVID 19 Come on! And so the official uh, at Donkey Kong Ape account quote tweeted it and said, "What?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> the the at because every it's weird because like everyone changed their photo, so it was hard to find again. But it said at real King K rule says nice. To, to which Donkey Kong says, I am coming to your house. <laughs> to which King K. Rool says, Donkey Kong, are you encouraging your followers to not practice social distancing? <laughs> to which Donkey Kong replies, I'm encouraging you to start running. <laughs> and that's good video game storytelling as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Kyle, what do you got? Uh, hey, get a load of this. Have you guys heard about this Tiger King documentary oh on boy. Netflix? It's kind of obscure. Uh-huh. You want me talking about it? No, I have, a, I have a real one. That show is insane, though. People are not wrong about that. Um, this is from February. Um, it's a, it's just a very simple tweet, just very straightforward. It's from Sean Murray, the official No Man's Sky account, and it's a GIF from Grand Theft Auto uh, Five, and it shows a like the Zeppelin, like crashing into the planetarium, and then uh, the protagonist character kind of like happens to land on a ledge. And then walk right into a, a cutscene activation point. So like, it's it it's this like colossal explosion, and then it just very easily tr like transitions into smooth cutscene. You know? Yeah. It's very funny. But the thing that made me laugh about it, especially, was Sean Murray just tweeted next to it, launching a video game be like, which is just very much like, oh yeah, No Man's Sky. It just totally <laughs> exploded, crashed on landing, but it's like, but now it's like, you know, That's went right fun. into that cutscene without any issue. That's fun. Jeff, um, it's a fun tweet. Hey, get a load of this. Whoa. Uh, it's a it's another video that you're just gonna have to put in the link for oh, whatever. Yeah. But people it is have you guys seen the video of the super realistic forest in dreams? Yes. It is insane I how thought good it, was, it looks. I thought it was fake. I thought it was too. I thought it was just a video of someone walking through an actual forest, yes. you know, like a phone video. But it looks better than most engines at this point, and but like, somehow still done in dreams. It is mind-boggling to think that, like, okay, obviously it's not going to be the most flexible thing. I'm sure sprinting through the forest isn't an option. There's probably secret walls everywhere. But yes, it is mind-boggling, like the natural environments that people are cranking out of dreams at this point. Yes. Great So one. check that out. Please. Get a load of it. Uh, hey, get a load of this. Uh, it's an older one, but I missed it. Uh, January 27th, 2020, Mark Laidlaw, who is kind of the, the lead narrative designer for the Half-Life series, he left and wrote Epistle 3, his version of Episode 3. is a long story thing. But he tweeted out, I just saw this in my custom Laidlaw alerts, quote, and the script for Half-Life Alex by Eric Wolpaw, Jay Pinkerton, and Sean Vanneman has been validated by Mark Laidlaw. Uh, and then Mark says, no, it hasn't. They don't need my validation. They are great writers. I saw no script. I only know what's in the trailer. And then he followed up and said, People forget that Portal 2 and Portal 1 have some of the best writing and wildly surprising inventiveness of any science fiction in any medium. I expect Half-Life Alex to be fresh and surprising specifically because of my lack of involvement. If I'd been sitting in a room with Half-Life Alex creators, probably all I would have been doing is saying, You can't do that because we never did it. Sometimes the best thing you can do for something so that it can thrive is keep the f*** away from it. Uh, and then somebody tweeted at him and said, this is such a good attitude. And Mark says, I knew it was time to retire from Valve when I heard newer employees talking excitedly about stuff they wanted to do. And I had to stop myself from saying, quote, that's not how we do things. Um. But nice, nice tipping or passing of the torch there from Mark, Mark Laidlaw. And I, yeah. I, I would love to hear his thoughts on, on Half-Life Alex at this point. You know, it's, we'll talk about this more at the end of the year, I'm sure. But like Half-Life Alex one thing that has struck me a lot about that game other than like the vr and stuff is like it's the funniest game i've played this year like easily interesting and like i keep thinking that every time there's a joke i literally laugh out loud at i'm like i didn't i never expected half life to be like the funniest game i've played in a long time but it makes total sense with that portal 2 lineage like it, it's totally understandable yeah awesome community get a load of this jeff Get a load of this. Uh, it's another one from Rook, who is just the master of the Get a Load of This channel. 
Uh, but it is a tweet, and this one's specifically for you, Hanson. I yes. picked this one all for you. Andy Bio uh, sent out a tweet that said, not an April f- fool's joke. After severe downtime and a catastrophic database failure, Max Goldberg brought internet fixture back to life, rewritten to work with modern browsers, restoring new site creation and complete archives. Hanson, you know what it is. YTMD? YTMD, you're the man now, dog, dot com is back. Wow. And it looks pretty good. Wow. Is it like the same orange design or? Uh, it is. I think it was. Yes, it, it's okay. an orange looking website. Cool. Uh, but uh, I don't I don't know if it was the if it was the classic layout. This looks too good to be a classic layout. All right. But. Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, the site was very important to me uh, for making creative stuff. Wow. Hey, it is back online. I completely missed that. That's awesome. You know, some not so great stuff on there too, but you know what? It's the internet. <laughs> so you take what you can get. Uh, that's awesome. And those we'll, come from- We'll see how long it takes to get canceled. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, those come from the community Discord, which you get access to if you support us on Patreon. That's where Jeff was pulling the get a load of this because there's a whole channel that's constantly being updated with good community get a loads of this. Get, gets gets a loads of yeah gets these. a loads of it. there was another one in there i think it was also for rook but just as a quick aside apparently people aren't tipping uh like restaurant people pizza like you know delivery men that are that are dropping them off. there was one tweet by a pizza delivery man who said that even people that he was houses that he had gone to previously that normally tip it's because a lot of places are doing it where they where you don't have to interact with the server. You pay online, oh, okay. and then they just drop it off at your doorstep so that you never see them. And he's positing that because people don't see them, they don't think that they need tips anymore. Yeah, but they super do, and it sucks that they have to work now. So please, for the love of God, if you order any food, give them a big tip. Yes. Yeah, over over tip if you can. Oh, sure. I've been yeah. yeah. The few times that I've gotten food, I've really gotten nuts on tipping. It's like, well, I gotta yeah, do it. Same here. Yeah. That's very sweet. Um, hey, thanks everybody that watched or listened to this episode of the Midmax Show podcast. Um, we'll cycle out if you're going to be on the Wall of Heroes if you support us at the hundred dollar tier um, last month, and it's going to be kicking in this month. Um, and so let us know what image you want on there, or if you're still on it, let us know. Let us know if you want to change and all that fun stuff. But hey, thanks for sticking with us. Um, any help spreading the show, sharing it with a friend, if you enjoy it, we would appreciate. Uh, we're still going strong in these uh, troubled times, but the Midmax Studios in my basement, so more content than ever. I would I would dare to say it's a uh, it's fun times. But hey, that's it for this episode of the Midmax Show podcast. Then be good, have fun, let's go. Mm-hmm.